Hi, it's Dave. Welcome. Today, I'm joined by James Dama, our resident machine learning expert by Farzad Misbahi. He runs a YouTube channel by the same name and Nicholas Gibbs, who runs a YouTube channel called Investing Against the Grain. And today we're going to do a dive into Dojo. And last week, Tessa in their AI Day presentation highlighted their hardware and software progress with their Dojo Super uh, Training Computer. And in this episode, we're actually going to watch the Dojo a video section that Tesla presented. We're going to do it at 1.5x speed to speed it up a bit. And then we're going to have James um, Dalma answer any questions. And anyone here in this uh, room here will be able to stop the video and just kind of discuss any comments. If you don't understand anything, feel free to ask. And this would be a great time um, just to really try to get a better understanding of what Tesla is doing with their dojo plans and why it's important in the bigger picture. Um, James, did you want to go ahead and add a few words before we get started with the video? Yeah, so we're trying a new structure here. Um, Dave and I have been uh, previously trying to walk through these uh, these uh, videos uh, using kind of a slide deck as a sort of mechanism for reminding us where we're at and what was going on. And, um, and so the structure was I would try to explain the slides and Dave would ask questions and that kind of stuff. And so I hopefully what we were able to do is pull out uh, some of the extremely technical stuff that, that 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 is going on and kind of translate it into terms that are more accessible to more people and give a, a sense of what's going on there ideally there are kind of three different perspectives that in the best of all possible worlds we'd be able to represent one where you have people who are kind of technical um and just you know need some more filler you know so explaining stuff from with from with some amount of technical backgrounds that works for them. People who are kind of sort of Tesla focused or business focused who want to sort of, their perspective would be like, what does this mean for the company? And then someone who's neither of those who just wants to understand like, what does this mean for the world? What is that kind of stuff? So you would have sort of three different degrees of expertise and also three different perspectives in terms of, in terms of asking questions. So of course, we're not usually going to be able to adequately represent all of those things, but to the degree possible, I would like, you know, people, participants to, you know, ask questions with that kind of framework in mind, that there's all these different um, interests and all these different perspectives and all these different expertise. So if something's falling through the cracks, please let's pause and, and, and talk about it a little bit so that, um, so that people get as much value as they, as possible out of the time that we spend here doing this. All right. Sounds great. Uh, the dojo section of Tesla Idea is about 30 minutes. Um, one, one and a half times speed is going to be 20 minutes. So we'll go through the video and um, take our time um, asking questions and commenting. So let's go ahead um, to this video view. And James, if you can go ahead and control the starting of the video, we'll get started here. Okay. We'll start with Pete's comments. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for hanging in there. We're almost there. My name is Pete Bannon. I run the uh, custom silicon and low voltage teams at Tesla. And my name is uh, Ganesh Renkin. I run the Dojo program. Thank you. I'm frequently asked, why is a car company building a supercomputer for training? And this question fundamentally misunderstands uh, the nature of Tesla. At its heart, Tesla is a hardcore technology company. All across the company, people are working hard in science and engineering to advance the fundamental understanding and, and methods that we have available to build cars, energy solutions, robots, and anything else that can we, we can do to improve the human condition around the world. It's a super exciting thing to be a part of, and it's a privilege to run a very small piece of it in the semiconductor group. Um, tonight, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, Dojo and give you an update on what we've been able to do over the last year. Um, but before we do that, I wanted to give a little bit of background on the initial design uh, that we started a few years ago. I mean, just to interject, I think uh, Pete Bannon here, he really succinctly and precisely defines Tesla as this hardcore technology company focused on improving the human condition. So it's actually a very broad uh, mission um, through cars, energy solutions, and robots, and whatever else right, they can find. So it's a quite broad mission, yet it's very um, pointed in how Tesla's doing it through hardcore tech right, and, and solutions. So yeah, I thought that was um, a great intro by Pete Bannon. Yeah, I agree. I think I think what what stands out to me from that statement is that you know we know Tesla has had this mission statement for ever since its inception of advancing you know the 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 transition to sustainable transportation. But is this sort of the the official changeover from a 
from a mission perspective for the company that says, oh, and by the way, we're just going to make everything better, <laughs> essentially for human beings, right? So I, I wonder... I wonder how well understood that is amongst folks that are investing in Tesla and and because it to me it seems like it's really become part of the DNA not just to deal with energy and cars it's just make humanity better and this is how you make humanity better it seems like as you work on really 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 tough things from a te from a technology perspective um, I don't know it just seems and, and like I'm almost waiting for them to update their website to say this is our new mission statement here in the coming weeks I don't know if you guys feel the same way but um, that that was my takeaway from when I first heard that comment, I, I can't remember if one of you two echoed this before too. I, I think I've heard it from someone else too, but it just seems like a major shift in the culture of Tesla and how they're looking to solve problems down the line uh, to to impact everybody and not just from an energy and transportation perspective. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was just gonna say good stop on here, Dave, because. When I watched this, I was in Greece. It was like 4 a.m. when I was watching this. I was like exhausted. But the one thing that nice I did honeymoon. notice immediately, yeah. <laughs> the one thing I noticed immediately was he was the first person to echo how Elon started off AI Day, which is essentially trying to make a point that we are a technology company. We are not just a car company, which seemed to be the theme of all of this. And going away from AI Day Part 2 to AI Day 2022, right? It just, it seems like you could tell what the impetus behind a lot of this was. Yeah. And also, I think with Dojo, it's such a complicated, ambitious project. Really, you've got to be a hardcore tech company to even try this. You know? <laughs> Otherwise, you're going to fall flat on your face. Um, so I think it's a good test uh, for, for his uh, statement here. Yeah. Agreed. All right. When we we'll got continue. started, the goal was to provide a substantial improvement to the training latency for our autopilot team. Some of the largest neural networks they train today run for over a month, which inhibits their ability to rapidly explore alternatives and evaluate them. So, you know. Um, James, I'm curious. Um, he's saying that some of the largest neural networks Tesla trains trains takes over a month. What do you think those networks are specifically? Uh, it's probably the probably the uh, the neural network that's used for the auto labeler. The um, uh, the most important neural network that they probably train is the the one that's used for inference inside the car that runs inside the the FSD chip, but that's that neural network is going to be pretty constrained in terms of like how big it can get because you got to run it in a car. On the other hand, the auto labeler is going to run on this cluster that they've got, so they can allow uh, they can do a different trade off there where they can let the network get a lot bigger and it's more resource intensive, but they get more accuracy. And with the auto labeler, you want that because it's making the labels that are used to train everything downstream. So you become very sensitive to how accurate that network is. So they're probably erring on the side of going big on that network. And that would that's probably the one they're doing. Incidentally, 30 days of training time on a cluster, and I think they told us they're using 10,000 GPUs, that's going to be a really big neural network. That, now... Andre had told us in the past how they go about training these things. I mean, you can, if you do a, a full on train from like, you know, you start with a blank neural network and you train it all the way up, that takes 30 days. But of course they can refine little parts of it by basically breaking off a part, just training that bit, plugging it back on. So it's probably the case that most of the training they do is like these, this modular stuff, but every once in a while, you know, you, once you've made enough changes to all the modules, you're going to go back and do a complete retrain from scratch to make sure everything still plays well together. Got it. Wow. So crazy amount of uh, training compute power. Nicholas. Yeah. Quick question, James. Do you happen to know when we talk about this with Dojo, should we be thinking of this from a abstracted, so some kind of hypervisor in between that, or is this all bare metal computation that we should be thinking about this? Yeah, so that's a thing that this this talk actually gets into in some in some detail. Um, I mean, Pete is about to describe in this little monologue that he has at the start some of the restrictions that they signed up for when they went with the particular approach to Dojo that they are. Most hardware for most computers in the world has a lot of hardware support for making the programming easier. But that hardware support, it comes at a cost. It can, it requires, I mean, in particular, it requires that the system have more memory. And it also requires that you, 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 in, you insert certain things in your data path, caching, uh, virtual memory, stuff like that can make the job of writing software for the hardware easier, but then it increases the memory load. And to, uh, Steve, Pete's going to explain now like why they didn't go that way. 
And that because they don't go that way, it has a lot of implications for the rest of the stack and how the software works. So Dojo ends up being very dependent on having an extremely capable compiler because the, the hardware itself, it's not going to do, the hardware is not going to do much stuff on the fly for you. Your compiler has to figure oh. out ahead of time where every byte goes, where it gets stored in memory, what order it goes in. So the, so, so the thing can be run deterministically, like the, the compiler has to figure everything out uh, on, on day one. So, and then, so the second half of this talk is going to spend a lot of time talking about the compiler. So that's a, that's a good observation and a good, uh, a good lead into that. Mm. Okay. Could I ask Go ahead. Sorry, Present. just one quick one. So mm -hmm. for the lay layman like myself, so so does this mean then because they're taking an approach and you tell me if this analogy doesn't make sense, but I, this is how it makes sense in my head. Typically, something like this would have quote unquote training wheels that would uh, take up some sort of compute power in the same in the same packaging. But by then removing these quote unquote training wheels, they're they're able to access or additional compute power or whatever, however you want to describe that to allow them to do more with the same. So that's one optimization effort. And then I'm guessing they have other optimizations going on on top of that. Is that, is that the right way of thinking about what you just I would mentioned? I would describe it a little bit differently. Um, okay. The, for instance, you've, you've got your Intel processor in your computer and your Intel mm -hmm. processor, it has virtual memory and it has caches. Let's talk about caches a minute. So memory uh, for the processor to run quickly it, it can run much more quickly and efficiently if it's fetching, if the working set of data that it's immediately working from is on the chip, because there's mm -hmm. somewhere between 100 and 1,000x time and power penalty for going off chip. So how do you ensure that everything that you need is optimally loaded onto the chip? Well, so there's two, there are two kind of broad different ways that you can do this. One of them is that you have some heuristics that run on the processor and hardware. And what they do is they have some simple rules where they look at the code that's, going, that's about to be executed and they guess what that code is gonna need for memory. And then the, that hardware fetches that and puts it on the cache. So when the processor actually needs it, it's already on board. Now that requires that you have a cache. It requires that you have this prefetching hardware and it requ requires that you do a good job of predicting what right. the stuff is gonna need. The other way you could do it is you could get rid of the cache. You could get rid of the prefetch and all that kind of stuff. And instead you have a compiler that exactly models everything the processor is going to have to do. And then what it does is it predicts what that, I mean, it can look after it runs the stuff in a sort of internal simulator, what it's going to need. And then it puts instructions to preload that. It injects them into the instruction stream. So on the one hand, your compiler has to be a lot more powerful. On the other hand, you have to add significant uh, capability to your hardware. Now, one of the reasons you want the hardware to do that is if the hardware is not always the same. I can download a piece of software and you can run it on an x86 or 386 or you know later processors. You can buy a fancier processor from Intel that has a bigger cache and somebody else can buy a smaller one. And, you, and the two of them can both run the same code because the compiler that is that generates the binary, it doesn't have to know every single detail. It just needs to kind of broadly know what the capabilities are because it can rely on the chip to do some of the lifting itself in terms of pr predicting this stuff ahead of time. In the case of Dojo, because they're very restricted on the memory resources they have and they can't afford this caching stuff and they can't afford page tables, what they do is they go to the opposite extreme. They have the compiler figure everything out. Mm -hmm. And so that compiler has to know exactly what machine you're running on, exactly what IO channels it has, exactly how many tiles it, it uses and, and whatnot. And so part of this talk about Dojo is they're, them essentially saying, this is the way we went, and then talking about some of the challenges of doing that to appeal to people who might be interested in working on that problem to come to Tesla and work on it. Got it. OK. Thank you. A 30x speed up would be really nice if we could provide it at a cost competitive and energy competitive way. Um, to do that, we wanted to uh, build a chip with a lot of arithmetic, arithmetic units that we could utilize at a very high efficiency. And we spent a lot of time studying whether we could do that using DRAM, various packaging ideas, um, all of which failed. And in the end, even though it felt like an unnatural act, we just decided to reject DRAM as the primary storage medium for this system and instead focus on SRAM embedded in the chip. SRAM provides, unfortunately, a modest amount of capacity, but extremely high bandwidth and very low latency. And that enables us to achieve high utilization with the arithmetic units. Those choices, uh, that particular choice led to a whole bunch of other choices. For example, if you want to have virtual memory, you need page tables. They take up a lot of space. We didn't have space, so no virtual memory. Uh, 
We also don't have interrupts. The accelerator is a bare bones, raw piece of hardware that's presented to a compiler, and the compiler is responsible for scheduling everything that happens in a deterministic way. So there's no need or even desire for interrupts in the system. We also chose to pursue uh, model parallelism as a training methodology, which is not the typical situation. Most, uh, most machines today use data parallelism, which consumes additional uh, memory capacity, which we obviously don't have. So all of those choices led us to build a machine that is pretty radically different uh, from what's available today. Um, we also had a whole bunch of other goals. One, one of the most important ones was no limits. So we wanted to build a compute fabric that would scale un in an unbounded way for the most part. I mean, obviously, there's physical limits now and then. Um, but you know, pretty much if your model was too big for the computer, you're, you just have to go buy a bigger computer. Uh, that's what we were looking for. Today, the way pack machines are packaged, there's a pretty fixed ratio of, for example, GPU. So it might be a good point to stop. It, okay. Pete tosses a lot of stuff out here really quickly. So, yeah. uh, so one of the things, this uh, so Dojo is a qualitatively different way of approaching the, the the challenge of building a big computer to train neural networks than uh, than most of the systems that are out there today. Now there are there are some startup companies that are doing interesting things, but most of the of what happens is either happening on big NVIDIA clusters where you essentially you have um, hundreds or thousands of boxes and, we, and where each one has eight or 16 GPUs in it and they all have a fast network that connects them. So, you know, it may be that most of the training is happening on the GPU chips in the cards in those boxes. But once you get a problem that's big enough that, that, that one GPU can't do a good job of it, now you start you start having to figure out how to break the problem up into pieces and dole it out to a bunch of different GPUs. And the constraints you have in that situation are, you know, each GPU has, it runs at a certain speed and it can do a certain amount of calculation. It has a certain amount of memory. It has a certain speed that it can talk to other GPUs in the same box. It has a certain speed with which it can access memory in the, in the box. And so you have all of these kind of speed constraints. These matter a lot because uh, a, a, like a fast GPU in A100, its interface to its local memory might be a terabyte per second, like really, really fast. But as soon as you go off of the off of the card and you go to main memory or you go to the next GPU over, you are 10x slower, maybe more than that. And then once you have to go outside the box you're in to another box, you might be another 10x or another 100x slower. So if you're going to build, so when you slice the problem up, the amount of communication that you uh, that you have to do between what's happening on the individual GPUs is we call this sort of the the degree of coupling and the uh, and and the and you become so called communication bound. That is, you could have a GPU that can do you know three hundred teraflops per second, but the problem because of the way you break the problem down. If you run, even if the GPU runs at three hundred teraflops per second, it finishes its part of the problem in 10, you know, in a certain amount of time. And that now it spends 10 times as much time as it just spent working, waiting to get mm. the next chunk that it needs or handing its results to somebody else. So you become compute bound in that situation because, because the flops on your chips don't kind of, they're not the things that are setting how fast you can go. The network is setting how fast you can go. Um, uh, Dojo just does this a completely different way by essentially having extremely high bandwidth between these die. So, uh, so essentially you don't have to be as clever about how you break the problem down. And if you can't break the problem down, some problems just can't be broken down. Some parts of the process or training a neural network don't break down in a way that you can decouple two different things. They, they still have to exchange a lot of data in order to, to, uh, in order to make progress. And so uh, Dojo is gonna be much less susceptible to those kinds of, of limitations. They're, they're going to be much less compute bound, if you will. But that uh, the trade-off that they have there is they're, they're not gonna use any DRAM. So DRAM, you know, the DRAM that you might have on say an A100 chip, you know, in, in NVIDIA's latest, greatest, well, actually, it's not the newest one. They have an H100, but you, they're unobtainium right now. So nobody's putting them in clusters. But if you look at an A100, you get maybe 80 gigabytes of memory locally on the card that it can work with. So, so a single A100 has a lot of DRAM it can work with. It's, it's got not very much memory on the chip, but it has, a you know, say a terabyte per second or so that it can get to the memory that's on the same card. So, so when you're optimizing for an NVIDIA uh, thing, you, 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 you start with, well, whatever we put on a single GPU, let's assume 
it's got a really small amount of really fast memory, but then 80 gigabytes of pretty fast memory. You know, it's pretty good. So, uh, so what they do, so what you do is you partition the problem. So, it, so that those are kind of the kind of boundaries that you're working inside. Um, in the case of Dojo, these individual chips, they have, um, well, there's one, so there's 350 nodes on each one of their die, their D1 die, and each one of those has one and a quarter megabytes. So that whole chip has on the order of like 500 megabytes or something like that, 400 and something megabytes. And that's a lot smaller. That's dramatically smaller than 80 gigabytes. And what that means is the way you slice the problem up to run it is going to be very different than when you have a lot more memory on each CPU, but they're but they, but their interconnections between the CPUs are a lot slower. So, so in a sense, there's a technical challenge to what they're doing. They're 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 going a significantly different way than uh, than the existing you know really big computers are with doing this. Now, uh, uh, Pete he alludes to one other thing where he said, let's talk. You know, we we wanted a system that could scale with no limits. That you could just buy a bigger computer if you had a bigger problem and. Uh, from the outside, you're like, well, yeah, why wouldn't you just buy a bigger computer to, you know, to run faster? And the uh, the consequences of this of this being compute bound thing are that the 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 overhead of like the bigger your problem gets in a particular architecture, the slower the architecture gets if you're compute bound. So, for instance, say for instance, you know, he was talking about we, you know, we run it, we have a big neural network, we run it on a ten thousand node thing, and it takes thirty days. To, uh, uh, to, uh, to, to, to produce an output that, that, that the team can work with. And we'd like that to be a lot faster. We'd like it to be a day so they could try something, make a change, see what the result was, make another change and so on. Right now, you know, if, if it takes a month to get your answer, you can't do that. You don't wanna wait a month and find out you were wrong and oh, let's flip this other bit and run another month. You know, That's on the scale of the duration of the program. So how much, fa how much bigger a computer would you need? You know to in order to say to get to a day well off the top of your head you might say well you know a 30 times bigger computer so they've got a machine that they spent like 100 million dollars on say roughly and it's got 10,000 nodes and it's uh, you know and it takes 30 days so first of all getting a 30x bigger computer is kind of expensive now you're talking about 3 billion dollars right but the bad news is it won't be 30 times faster because you you get this thing where it can't where these machines, because they're compute limited, they don't scale linearly. They don't, in other words, twice as big a computer doesn't run twice as fast because the communication overhead sort of, it gets more and more clogged as, as you go bigger. So for them to actually get this, they might need a hundred X or 150 X bigger machine to get a 30 X speed up. So you've got this scaling problem, which is as we go bigger, once we hit a certain point, even if we go a lot bigger, we're not getting our money's worth when we do that. So Dojo solves that problem nicely because it removes the communication bottleneck. So when Steve says, or sorry, when Pete says, why do I keep calling him Steve? Um, so when Pete says, you just buy a bigger computer, if your problem is 2x too big, you just need 2x as big a computer. You don't need 3x or 5x as big a computer to run twice as fast. Got it. Um, <clears throat> all right. So let me summarize a bit for the layperson. Um, correct me if I'm wrong here. So it seems like, you know, with typical GPU clusters, one of the problems is um, first, if you use the DRAM, then it's you're slowing down um, the process um, to access the DRAM compared to the memory on the chip. Um, and then you've got this other issue of communicating between GPUs and also uh, all these nodes between each other, where you're just reducing its the the speed at which it can compute. But Tesla's approach is they're saying, okay, let's go ahead and um, if we can connect everything together, not use DRAM as much, use SRAM, which is memory on the chip. Let's load basically everything on this. I guess on a later slide, they'll call it sea of nodes, laid mm -hmm. all on the computer. And then let's have the computer process the, the neural net math, which is like matrix math, math, where it's just pushing the results within the chip itself, I'm guessing, rather than having to go off chip to save the results and, and bring it back. And they're doing that. So it's like a huge, I guess, increase in 
how fast it could, you know, perform their operations because it's a multiple, I guess, way of things. It's you're communicating faster between the all the chips. You're using less off chip memory. You're loading the whole model, let's say, on one go, and you're, you know, it's basically optimized an optimized system, not just a chip, but an entire um, training system, right? To uh, run huge neural nets and train them super fast on a completely def different level than what um, the current generation of GPUs can do. Yeah, what am I missing very, here? I mean, an important thing to understand about the way this stuff is done today is it wasn't, nobody sat down and said, in the best of all possible worlds, what would be the best you know, way to build a supercomputer? In the past, when people have done that, they did not end up with lots of boxes connected by cables, right? When Cray was building, they would build really big processors and really fast memory. The reason that we're in this space is because chips have gotten really fast. And, but, but you can only afford to make lots and lots of these really fast chips if you kind of mass produce them. So, uh, so we ended up in a world where the, way, the most economical way to build a really big computer was to build lots of small identical units where the individual unit doesn't have a lot of compute. Uh, you know, and there's a big market for server boxes and for desktops and that kind of stuff. So all that infrastructure brings down the cost of like having a GPU on a PCI card in a box. Once upon a time before we're now in the, these, the, the current generation of supercomputers, we call them clusters because they'll, there are hundreds or thousands of individual machines, which are not particularly fast by themselves. They're definitely not super com computer mainframe class. But we learned a thing back in the 80s, which or the late 80s, that, es that essentially people who were going out and building supercomputers by bu buying a bunch of these commodity, you know, fairly li limited systems, for the same amount of money, they were getting much faster computers than people who were designing these totally pure spec uh, supercomputers. And so clusters just became the way everything got done. We kind of backed into this because of sort of the commercial popularity of these compute units. Mm. Um, and so today, there are very few, you know, uh, systems that are built that that are just pure supercomputers, where like the parts in them are only used in supercomputers. They're not used for anything else. All the supercomputers today, they're built out of parts that are also useful for lots of other stuff, because that's how we get, you know, inexpensive parts uh, to do this kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, the D1 chip, it's not going to make a great gaming <laughs> CPU, you know, I mean, it, it's kind of a return to the, cra I mean, uh, Elon mentioned the Cray as uh, as sort of an inspiration or like a, a similar sort of thematically different from the current generation of supercomputers. Uh, that Cray was a purpose-built supercomputer. Every single part, every single chip inside it was just for that supercomputer. Um, and they don't, they only, the architecture only made sense when you were building a computer at a certain scale. Today, these super micro boxes that these clusters make, you can buy one, you can sit on your desk and you can use that, or you can buy a rack, a 42U unit that might have 10 of these boxes or would have less, say six of these boxes in it. And then you, you know, in principle, you can just keep scaling up. The problem is it scales sublinearly. So, you know, if you buy twice as many racks, it's not twice as fast. It's somewhat less than twice as fast, depending on the problem that you're doing. Neural networks are fairly, they scale pretty well, but they don't scale well enough uh, uh, that, you know, if you want a hundred times as much compute, uh, it's, it can be very inconvenient to just keep trying to scale up the number of boxes that you have. And so Dojo represents a different approach to that. So I uh, if I could uh, ask a quick question here. So the, co the compiler, uh, correct me if I'm wrong here. So, so one of the real innovations that Tesla has figured out here with this sort of um, low RAM on the chip, but capable of basically transmitting information between each other incredibly fast is how that information is piecemealed so that it's able to process it, right? So like it's instead of saying, here's, I don't know, uh, an entire book, here's one page, but I can give you that page very, very often so you can compute yeah. it and, and go through it very fast, right? So how big of a moat is that? And how is that going to prevent it from potentially like using the hardware for other things in the future? Or is this like an, an incorrect way of asking the question? Th no, I mean, if you, if you mean moat as in business moat, like pre how, what or prevents difficulty. other people from just doing this yeah. right away? Right. The, the obstacle to doing it is you got to design your own chip and you got to build your own supercomputer. You can take the idea the basic idea and work with that. But the thing is the amount of work that it takes to employ that idea, to put it to work for you is enormous. 
So yeah. no small startup company is going to be able to compete with, you know, is going to be able to build their own dojo. Like the, the effort, it, it's going to take too much specialty. It's going to cost too much money. A bigger company could do it. Like Google could do this if they decided that they wanted to do it. They've got the resources. Uh, they probably wouldn't do it as fast as Tesla does, but they could. And the basic idea is not the kind of, you probably can't even get a patent on this idea. Like inside the computer science space, it's, it would be a little too obvious. A patent examiner probably wouldn't give you a patent on this. But what what they're doing is they're making a big commitment to this approach. They're throwing a lot of resources into it. And along the way, they're going to discover where it works well. And they're also going to discover places where it doesn't work well. And they're going to have to come up with workarounds for that. So I, it just occurred to me, like once before when I was describing this stuff to Dave, I used this kind of factory metaphor. So in a sense, a, you know, a GPU core is a certain size, uh, you know, it's a certain size factory. And the, the DRAM is like a warehouse attached to the factory. So how much stuff can that make? Well, you know, the factory can build as much stuff until it runs through its warehouse of parts and, and until it fills up its warehouse of like completed cars, whatever, whatever it is it makes. Now, how far away is the nearest other factory that's working with? Like if I'm building a bunch of factories, um, so in a sense, the latency is like how long the road is to the next factory, like say the factory that builds the parts that come into you. There's a lot of difference between if that road is five miles or 50 miles or it goes all the way to China. So in the, in the case of, of, um, in the case of Dojo, you're, you're, you're building lots and lots of factories um, and they're about the same size as the typical GPU factory, right? That runs in these other clusters, but, uh, but they're right across the street from another. In fact, they're, this, they're on this grid, you know, they're just right next door to each other. So they can move stuff back and forth between each other easily, but each one only has a relatively small warehouse. So you have to figure out how to build your manufacturing process so that the output from one goes right next door and the output yeah. from that one goes right next door. To the extent that you can do that, this is gonna be super fast right? You've just got a pipeline feeding this stuff to the extent that you can't do that. It, you know, the fact that you don't have a very big warehouse could end up really hurting you. So, uh, you know, Tesla went and they looked at this problem and they decided that every problem they care about can be done without the big warehouse, right? You have to do it a little different than the guys who have the factories that are spread out, but have the bigger warehouses. Um, yeah. but they believe they can do it. And I, I believe, I actually am a big fan of the approach that they have. So you'll see me talking positively it's, about it. It's funny you say that because it, it sounds like a digital form of just-in-time inventory, but for compute power. Yeah, right? it's just-in-time compute. Fascinating. Right? Yeah. yeah, so cool. Just All to right. add in real quick, what, what James is saying about Dojo and how it's built, it is completely different than what everybody else does. Completely. Everybody else, you'll see, you know, whether it's DRAM, I don't, I've never seen anything with SRAM, but you end up having a bottleneck there and then you solve that problem. Okay. Then maybe it's on your cache and then, okay, maybe you solve that problem. Now it's the GPU or the CPU that loads into the GPU. And then you solve that problem. Maybe it's storage and gain the IO in there. And then, okay, we solved that now it's networking. And then if you solve all that, then you have these siloed issues that it just doesn't scale out. And the fact that Tesla is able to do this and scale and seemingly have really good growth with that scaling that's wild. That's absolutely wild to see. I mean, everything I see um, out in the world with most things are kind of like what you're talking about, James, just x86 or super micro rebranded type stuff where they're just making their own stuff under under the covers. But the scalability and being able to get to that large of clusters, like that's something you just, it, it's just fundamentally different. I mean, no interrupts, going to SRAM, cash. I mean, it's it's pretty wild stuff. Like it's it's not just, I don't see it as, iterating or optimizing it's a whole new recipe of how to do this yeah the the fundamentals definitely it's a it's a it's a clean sheet rethink of how you build a big computer to do neural networks to train yeah. them yeah especially doing large models um with you know that need a lot of training power um yeah let's continue on with the CPUs and, and DRAM capacity and network capacity. And we really wanted to disaggregate all that so that as models evolved, we could vary the ratios of, of those various elements and, and make the system more flexible to meet the needs of the autopilot team. Yeah, and, and it's so true, like no limits philosophy was our guiding star all the way. All of our choices were centered around that. And, and to the point that we didn't want traditional data center infrastructure to limit our capacity to execute these uh, programs at speed. That's why we, sorry about that. That's why we integrated vertically our data center 
the entire data center by doing a vertical integration of the data center, we could extract new levels of efficiency. We could optimize power delivery, cooling, and as well as system management across the whole data center stack rather than doing box by box and integrating that, those boxes into data centers. And to do this, we also wanted to integrate early to figure out limits of scale uh, for our software workload. So we integrated Dojo environment into our autopilot software very early, and we learned a lot of lessons. And today, uh, Bill Chang uh, will go over our hardware update as well as some of the challenges uh, that we faced along the way. And uh, Rajiv Kurian will uh, give you a glimpse of our compiler technology as well as uh, go over some of our cool results. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Pete. Thanks, Ganesh. Um, I'll start tonight with a, a high-level vision of our system that will that'll help set the stage for the, the challenges and the problems we're solving, and then also how software will then leverage this for performance. Now, our vision for Dojo is to build a single unified accelerator, a very large one. Software would see a seamless compute plane with globally addressable, very fast memory, and all connected together with uniform high bandwidth and low latency. Now, to realize this, we, we need to use density to achieve performance. Now, we leverage technology to get this density in order to break levels of hierarchy all the way from the chip to the scale-out systems. Now, silicon technology has, has, used this, has done this for decades. Uh, chips have followed Moore's law to, for density and integration to get per, uh, performance scaling. Now, a key step in realizing that vision was our training tile. Not only can we integrate 25 dies at extremely high bandwidth, but we can scale that to any number of additional tiles by just connecting them together. Now, last year, we showcased our first functional training tile. And at that time, we already had workloads running on it. And since then, the team here has been working hard and diligently to deploy this at scale. Now, we've made amazing progress and had a lot of milestones along the way. And of course, we've had a lot of unexpected challenges. But this is where our fail fast philosophy has allowed us to push our boundaries. So um, just looking at this a second. So uh, there have been a lot of questions the last year about um, you know, where are they on Dojo? Well, you know, we heard uh, at the last uh, AI day, they had Dojo and we saw that they had a training tile up. And so there, you know, we had these questions like, you know, do they have the tiles talking to each other? Have they built a cabinet? Maybe there's a whole Dojo running someplace. Anyway, so they finally showed us a timeline that actually has uh, this stuff on it. And what we, uh, what we find is that they built their first Dojo cabinet in, toward the end of 2021. So like a year ago, they've had a Dojo cabinet for a year. Um, we don't know to what extent it was running, but you know, they, you know, they got up to the cabinet level, um, a year ago. And then, uh, the other interesting thing, they, there's a, there's a, a data point here that looks like it's in early 2022, which is, uh, they got a, uh, they got to a build rate of one tile a day. So, uh, so Tesla, they design the IC, but then somebody else fabricates the IC and then the IC comes into Tesla. And then Tesla has to make a tile with 25 of these ICs. So they have to test the individual ICs, uh, which are gonna, it's gonna take a significant amount of test infrastructure to do that, validate that this IC works perfectly, and then it becomes what's called a known good die. So then you take 25 of those known good die and they go on this interposer technology, which uh, is apparently being supplied by TSMC. And it allows 25 of these, you can only build the interposers so big. And that's why it ends up being five by five. The, the, the bigger the interposer gets, there, there are various issues with uh, thermal controls and, uh, and you know, being able to uh, build uh, the interposer in an error-free manner and so on that, that sort of don't scale really well. So typically there's an upper bound of, of, how, of how big you can go, which is also why ICs tend to not get any bigger than, uh, they built their, the, the current Dojo die like an A100 die, the GPU die that we were talking about. They're called reticle size die, which basically means the, the, uh, the, it's the biggest die that you can build inside that particular semiconductor process, just realistically. So they're already getting the biggest IC that they can, and they want to put 25 of these together onto an interposer. Then, then you have to bring power in, you have to get the heat out, you have to have all this mechanical infrastructure. Once you put all that stuff together, you get a tile. And a tile is a unit of compute. Uh, there are six tiles in a cabinet and 10 cabinets uh, in, a, in a dojo exapod. So to build out a full dojo, they need 120 tiles. So if they're building one tile a day, that, that means that about every three months, they're building about a dojo's worth of tiles. So, that, so as of earlier this year, that was kind of their manufacturing runway, run rate for the most critical 
com component that's going into Dojo. There's there's other stuff that they have to make custom, but most of that stuff is going to be much easier to build than the tile itself. So I thought those are both interesting data points from this uh, schedule. Got it. Um, so the tech says they're going to build their, is it their first Exapod early next year then? Yeah, so they said they'd have uh, an Exapod in Q1 2023. They mentioned okay. that later. Okay, yeah, okay, got it. They're building um, one tile per day. Okay, so 20, you got 25, basically, these IC, these chips on a tile, and then you've got six tiles together. Um, what does that form? Six, six tiles forms a tray. A tray, and then and you got yeah, two trays so in a cabinet. Two trays in right? a cabinet. And then 10 cabinets in an exapod. Right. So basically 120 tiles is one exapod. Got right. it. Okay. And they're hoping to build that first quarter of 2023. Yeah. So, I mean, okay. if they started at, um, you know, building one tile a day, um, you know, it looks like six months ago, mm -hmm. then they should have plenty of tiles for doing that. Um, so I don't know if something else is a limiter. Um, there's other stuff. Obviously, you don't just build the tiles. You have to get the other bits and pieces working. Okay, but. so I want to ask you, James, um, uh, what is, okay, one exapod, so, you know, 120 tiles in 10 cabinets. How many, like, equivalent, you know, NVIDIA A100 GPUs do you think that might be in terms of real life, real, t like, you know, real life, compute for Tesla's neural nets? Like what would yeah. be, you think the equivalent? Yeah, so uh, so an exapod ends up being 3000 die, right? 25 times 120, 25 die times uh, 120 tiles gets you 3000 die. Um, so if we want to compare it to, uh, to a GPU cluster and say, well, how many GPUs worth of stuff is that? We have to make some guesses about the problem space that we're working on and how efficiently it can use the different, uh, these different uh, boxes. So uh, after the last, the previous AI day, I went out and I looked at uh, benchmarks run on different size uh, NVIDIA clusters to try to get a sense of like how well they scale on neural network problems. And this is going to be a very imprecise number, but um, ResNet 50, which they're going to talk about a little later, and bigger ResNets, they're a common benchmark because they are a neural network. You do train them. The thing is supercomputers are so fast these days that that a ResNet doesn't like, you know, a decent sized supercomputer can train a ResNet in like a tenth of a second or two tenths of a second, like if you use a really big thing. So it's no longer a really good benchmark for comparing to these really big jobs. Nonetheless, this was the best numbers I could come up with. So uh, what I got was I found that a single, so if you look at uh, how, how many computations it takes to do this, uh, to, to say, to train this ResNet. And then you look at like, how fast is the GPU running flat out? Um, and then we, we say, well, you know, if the GPU arithmetic units were uh, perfectly utilized, how long would it take to run? And how long did it take to run when they ran the problem? And then you kind of get this scaling factor, like what efficiency is the thing running at? So I found that if you put the, if you run a ResNet inside a GPU, what you get is about 20% efficiency. That is, you know, if your GPU is, is it, it, you know, if it's a car that goes hundred miles an hour, then it so happens that the, the course we're actually asking it to run with this ResNet is such that the car can only average 20 miles an hour. So like effectively, you know, maybe I have my 100 tera ops, uh, you know, GPU, but I'm only getting to use 20 tera ops of it on this because it's spending the rest of the time waiting for stuff to get loaded from, you know, from in the case of a single GPU, it's just loading stuff from DRAM. Um, once I have a box full of GPUs and I, and I, you know, if say I've got eight GPUs now, um, ideally, you know, it would run eight times as fast running the same benchmark on there. And what I find is that it actually runs four times as fast. So we go from like 20% efficient to 10% efficient once we go to a whole box. And then if I go to a rack, I go to a cluster, something that's multiple boxes. Now we're getting down to about 5%. So, you know, my GPU might have hundred tera ops, but because of, I'm having to cut it up in little pieces and spread it out. And those pieces spend a lot of time waiting to talk to each other. I'm only actually running about five miles an hour or something like that. I'm getting 5% efficiency. So when I looked at, um, at slicing up stuff to run on the type of processor that Dojo has, 
my best guess is that they can run more like 80% efficiency. So to a first approximation, if we were comparing um, a dojo tile or a box of dojo tiles to say a rack, we get, we're comparing like, you know, 80% efficient to maybe 10% efficient. So we're probably getting maybe an 8x more compute out of each individual dojo tile that we're getting. So I would argue if these numbers hold and whether they hold depends a lot on the particular neural network you're training. And the, you know, so these are, these are pretty rough numbers that I took. I took their real numbers I got from real benchmarks, but they're not perfectly applicable to this problem. So they could be off by a factor of two in either direction. In any case, to a first approximation, I would say you're probably getting about an 8x speed up on really big problems using Dojo versus using clusters. So if you use those numbers, right, a single exapod is 3,000 uh, 3, D1 die. And that would be maybe 24,000 nodes of uh, A100 in a cluster. So the, the the machine that they're running for training right now is 10,000. So, you know, if these numbers are in the ballpark, right, a single uh, exapod would give them significantly more compute, maybe one and a half to two and a half times as much uh, effective speed as their 10,000 node computer is right now. Got it. That's so nice. for those um, kind of following here, um, typically a die or one of these um, chips will be comparable, uh, Tesla's Die will be one die will be comparable to an A100 by Nvidia yep. in terms of let's say operations per second. Yeah, they're but... both around 350 tera, tera ops at okay. the at the uh, using the numerical precision that these mm -hmm. neural networks require and that both of these chips can do. Got it. So if you had hypothetically 3,000 of these dies in a exapod you would think if if you're if you're if you ignore all this stuff that it'd be 3000 you know gpus worth of uh, mm -hmm. tops but because you're getting so much more efficiency let's say eight times um using these dojo chips you're basically getting eight times the amount so that's equal to 24000 gpus for tesla right now they have i think 14000 and in, in their three, yeah. three but clusters. They, so, so they have 4,000 they use for the auto labeler and 10,000 they use for training, they mentioned roughly. Okay. So they're just one exapod is going to be more than all of their training clusters put together, hypothetically. Yeah. If, Using if these this very up. crude yeah. sort of approximation for talking about yeah. this stuff. Yeah. And then once they make one exapod, I would imagine you get to 10, like within a, a year or two, maybe. I don't know. It, it doesn't seem like if you can get the software, everything working on that first exapod, and then you go to a hundred exapods, like this is getting kind of nutty after at a certain point. Well, yeah, so they meant, well, an exapod is like uh, multiple megawatts of power. <laughs> so, uh, and then, but I think they said later that they plan on having like seven of them there in, in Palo Alto. So that would be, you know, that would be a 20 X increase of the compute relative to what they have now. If my guess about the efficiencies is about right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hey James, what, whenever it's going through the training, I, I know we're mm -hmm. talking about the neural networks being trained, but how should we think about this? Like, do they train the entire stack at, at once essentially simultaneously, or will they take different modules of different neural nets within the bigger idea of FSD and train those independently? How's how's all that sorted out? And then I guess, how's it get brought back together to be, I guess, on par ready for delivery? I'm just trying to understand how how Dojo would affect that because I would imagine certain parts would be more than 8X and other parts might be less than 8X depending on the size of everything. Yeah, so the answer is they do both of those. The, as as uh, as Pete alluded to, um, the if they want to just train the whole thing up. So they, you know, you could imagine... They have on the order of 100 different, you know, uh, chunks of the neural network that go, this is that just go into the car. Um, you can now all of them interact with one another. And ideally, you would like to just like start with your training data, have your uh have your neural network, have your neural network architecture and train it. You, you get the best performance if you train it from scratch. But the thing is that takes a long time, uh, maybe not 30 days. If, if 30 days is the auto label and network, maybe the one that goes in the car takes a week or something. Uh, Andre had said at a talk he gave about two years ago that they were spending 70,000 GPU hours doing a full forward, uh, doing a full training pass 
on the network that went in the car. Well, so 70,000 training hours, like if you have a thousand GPUs, that's 70 hours and it's three days, which is I think the scale of the system that they had at that time. Of course, they're training on a lot more da data and the system is getting bigger. Anyway, tr the point is training the whole thing takes long enough that you don't want everybody on the team to be waiting, you know, to like train the whole network, especially because different parts of the team might want to train different versions of the network yeah. for some problem that they are looking at. So, in, so, in, so another way to, to, to be able to continue making progress without having to train the whole thing is you freeze part of the network and you just take off the chunk that you're worried about. Like you think the problem you have is is uh, is mostly encapsulated in this one piece of the network. So what you can do is you can train that, you can freeze most of the, you, you have a fully trained network and you wanna change this one part, you freeze most of the network and then you retrain the neural network, but you only allow the part you're interested in to change. So you won't be able to achieve the same overall performance and the same overall characteristics you would get if you retrain the whole thing, but you might be able to train it a hundred times faster. So the individual teams, when they have a problem they want to work on, they, they, they pull the last full neural network that ran. They just modify the part that they have, and then they do a training forward pass to test their idea or to test their new training uh, data or whatnot. So probably most of the actual training they do is these little chunks where they're testing variations on whatever the most recent best full up network is. But every once in a while, you know, you get this accumulation of changes the individual teams want. And at some point you're like, okay, we need to retrain the whole thing now because we, we need to understand how these things interact with one another and we want a new baseline. So then, then you do, you know, a, another whole one. So they might train the whole network um, say once a week and they, but they might spend most of the week when they are training, training like many iterations of, of smaller variations. So do you think they can carve up? Yeah, it does. You think they can carve up Dojo? So for yeah. instance, if we don't need all, okay, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that, that the diagram that they showed before, the sea of nodes, yeah. um, I don't know if it might be worth going back. So you remember the the picture, it's got 15, it has a 15 by uh, 120 by uh, 15 by 600 sort of grid of little yellow squares that they showed and they described it as their sea of nose. So those each five by five little subset of that is a tile. And that, and that um, 15 nodes is, is basically three tiles by all the cabinets. Uh, you know, this is the shape of, of, the, of the dojo fabric. So the fabric, each one of those tiles is embedded in a, it's connected to its north, south, east, west neighbors by extremely high bandwidth connection. So data can flow smoothly hop, hop by hop through that fabric. So when you want to run a problem on Dojo, what you do is you, you've, you've got a neural, you have a neural network model of a certain size. And if you want to load the whole model into, into it, say that you need, um, you know, say six tiles worth, right? So, the, so you have the compiler uh, compile it to fit exactly on six tiles. They have a just-in-time compiler. So when you want to send the job to the machine, you just-in-time compile a purpose-built binary that just runs on six tiles, which is a small subset of the whole of the whole dojo. And you run that one on just those six tiles. So at any uh, supercomputers. They're like production facilities, right? You want to keep, it's expensive. You want to keep the whole thing busy. You rarely need, you rarely, most of your problems aren't so big that they take the whole machine. Like 90% of your problems, 99% of your problems might take only a small fraction of the machine. So, uh, so what you do is you fit them on like puzzle pieces, right? You like today to, to make up 120 tiles worth of stuff, we're going to run these 15 jobs and then we're going to run these 12 jobs. And as jobs finish and they free up resources, you know, you can allocate more, another job of about that size onto, onto that subset of Dojo. So you can treat it like a bunch of different computers, which are dynamically allocatable by the, by the operating system, if you will, that sort of allocates these resources to the set of jobs it's trying to run right now. Kind yeah, of like te te Tetris, huh? Yeah. Fitting yeah. the right pieces. <laughs> Job. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, let's continue um, on. To deploy this at scale. Now, we've made amazing progress and had a lot of milestones along the way. And of course, we've had a lot of unexpected challenges. But this is where our fail fast philosophy has allowed us to push our boundaries. Now, pushing density for performance presents all new challenges. One area is power delivery. 
Here, we need to deliver the power to our compute die, and this directly impacts our top-line compute performance. But we need to do this at unprecedented density. We need to be able to match our die pitch with a power density of almost one amp per millimeter squared. And because of the extreme integration, this needs to be a multi-tiered vertical power solution. And because there's a complex heterogeneous material stack up, we have to carefully manage the material transition, especially CTE. Now, why does the coefficient of thermal expansion matter in this case? CTE is a fundamental material property. And if it's not carefully managed, that stack up would literally rip itself apart. So we started this effort by working with vendors to, deliver, to, to develop this power solution. But we realized that we actually had to develop this in-house. Now, to balance schedule and risk, we built quick iterations to support both our system bring up and software development, and also to find the optimal design and stack up that would meet our final production goals. And in the end, we were able to reduce CTE over 50% and meet our performance by 3x over our initial version. Now, needless to say, finding this optimal material stack up while maximizing performance at density is extremely difficult. OK. So uh, coefficient of thermal expansion is like when you heat materials and you cool them, that's how much they grow or they shrink. Um, electronics are frequently made out of stacks of materials. And sometimes those materials don't expand and contract as they warm up at, the, at, the, at exactly the same rate. So what happens is when you heat or cool the entire assembly, these mechanical stresses form inside the assembly. And over time, those repeated mechanical stresses start causing things to break inside. This is uh, especially a problem when you have something which has when, so that something that has high power density. Things with high power density, they, they get really hot, even if you're doing a good job taking the heat out. Like if you have something that's really, really hot, and then I have a cooler on it that is adequate to take all the heat out, all, that heat still has to flow between those two. And in order for the heat to flow, you need a big temperature differential. So the die itself might be getting really hot or the assembly might be getting really hot, even though I have a really good cooling system on it. So because the die is getting really hot, the die is, you know, it's all of the materials it's made of, the, the whole stack up from including the die, the package around it, the interposer. And in this case, in order to get power into the, this, this, uh, this, do this tile has a five by five grid of these D1 die on it. The way they bring power in is each one of those die has, has its own little power system that's, bolt, that's attached to the bottom of the interposer below it. So that little circuit board that we looked at a minute ago, it's, it's about the size of a postage stamp, which is about the size of a D1 die. And so there's one of those on the bottom of each one of the die, and it's part of the tile. It's integrated into the base of the tile. The, each die, the, the power, um, the voltage uh, and power cleanliness is super important for these chips. And the, uh, because of the very advanced process it's made, of, it actually operates at less than a volt. It's, it's probably operating at something like 0 0.7 volts is the actual voltage that the die runs at. To have a lot of power at a lot of vo low voltage means you have to have really, really high current. And they mentioned it, they're getting almost a thousand amps into one of these D1 die, which is insane. <laughs> it's just like, it, like uh, just to put that in perspective, that's like the current that runs into the motor in a, in a plaid, <laughs> right? When it's like at maximum boost, Goes like a thousand one. amps. That's kind of where the breaker blows on your plaid when you're taking off, right? If your motor goes over a thousand. So it's a crazy amount of power density. And they've got this little tiny, you know, postage stamp size, a DC to DC converter on the bottom, which is bringing some voltage in, regulating it down, cleaning it so it's nice and flat and feeding it into the bottom. They have to mount it really, really close to the die so that it has really good control over the power that's flow flowing into this die. They put it on the bottom. The die goes on the top of the interposer. Interposer is really thin, like less than a millimeter thick. And then this, this power converter is, goes on the bottom and there's one underneath each one of the die that just controls that die's power. So, because you have like a kilowatt of power running through this postage stamp, right? It, it's apt to get really hot. And if it gets really hot and it's not made out of, so the interposer is made out of silicon, which has a certain coefficient of thermal expansion. This, uh, this little module that goes on the bottom of it is not made out of silicon. It's got a little printed circuit board and a bunch of chips that are on it. So there's a different coefficient of thermal expansion between those two. And if you don't do a really good job of getting all the different layers pretty close to match, 
you turn it on and pop, and they're all going to pop yeah. right off the bottom of the board because, you know, in, in two seconds, it's going to heat up enough that it's going to break all the connections. So doing a material stack up where each material, it, every other material that it's connected to is pretty closely matched thermally or the connection is made elastic so that it can, uh, so that it can flex and not break, even if you, uh, act, th like this is a pretty significant problem. And the more power you run through a smaller area, the bigger a problem it is. So that's the essence of the problem that, that they're talking about here. And for somebody who works in power supplies, they're gonna get a, they're, you know, they're gonna look at this and they're gonna understand the magnitude of the problem and how interesting the technology must be for, for trying to tackle this thing. So let me just, uh, I wanna make sure I, understand, I understood this point. So each tile, which has 25 dies, is getting the equivalent power of 25 plaid motors running full bore through that one tile. It's getting the is equivalent current. Current, current be, excuse me. So current, the yeah. difference between the plaid motors, the plaid motors got 400 volts and a thousand amps. This has a thousand amps and like 0 0.7 volts. So the total power is less, but the current is similar. Yeah, and that so amper is where you're gonna get your heat from. <laughs> yeah, what the sort of is where the heat comes from? That's right. Got it. What sort of material science breakthroughs did Tesla have to go through? To in like, does this require any sort of new material science? Like, how how Maybe? do you do this? <laughs> yeah, they're probably right. not. Get, it's not the kind of thing that they would tell the public in this sort of presentation, right? Because that that would be the kind of stuff you'd want to keep to yourself until you had the patent on it. Um, they do actually share a few of the things that they did to mm -hmm. fix one issue, right? In this video. Yeah. Um, yeah. Why don't we go in, into that? I think it's probably coming up right now pretty soon. Okay. Now we did have unexpected challenges along the way. Here's an example. Let me this slide a second. So okay. um, here they mentioned they, they reduced the CTE by 54%. So this is the thermal mismatch between the two materials. So basically when it, when it thermal cycles, you, it only moves half as much relative to the other stuff. But the thing is, as you get the CTE down, you can crank up the power because you can go to higher power without breaking things. So as a result, but just by fixing the CTE problem, they were able to get 2.9 times as much power through that little converter. Yeah, just to highlight real quick, 14th version in 24 months. That's yeah, wild. 14. Yeah, that's, that's nuts. <laughs> right. That's really fast. Yeah. Stack up while maximizing performance at density is extremely difficult. Now, we did have unexpected challenges along the way. Here's an example where we pushed the boundaries of integration that led to component failures. This started when we scaled up to larger and longer workloads, and then intermittent, intermittently, a single site on a tile would fail. Now they started out as recoverable failures, but as we pushed to much higher and higher power, these would become permanent failures. Now to understand this failure, you have to understand why and how we build our power modules. Solving density at every level is the, is, is the cornerstone of actually achieving our system performance. Now because our XY plane is used for high bandwidth communication, everything else must be stacked vertically. This means all other components other than our die must be integrated into our power modules. Now that includes our clock and our power supplies, and also our system controllers. Now in this case, the failures were due to losing clock output from our oscillators. And after an extensive debug, we found that the root cause was due to vibrations on the module from piezoelectric effects, our nearby capacitors. Now, singing caps are not a new phenomenon, and in fact, very common in power design. But normally, clock chips are placed in a very quiet area of the board, and often not affected by power circuits. But because we needed to achieve this level of integration, these oscillators need to be placed in very close proximity. Now, due to our switching frequency and then the vibration resonance created, it caused out-of-plane vibration on our MEMS oscillator that caused it to crack. Okay. So, um, these uh, little I'm power like converters that sit on the bottom, they're going to make the 0.7 volts or 0.8 volts that the die requires. You don't bring 0.8 volts from someplace else because you don't want to have to run, you know, a thousand amp cables to... I mean, imagine running 25 cables with a cross section of a quarter inch to every tile. You don't do that. You bring the power in at a much higher voltage and lower current, and then you step it down. So these are, so these, but to get a lot of efficiency in a small package, these are switching regulators. They take a high voltage and they toggle it on and off with some duty cycle at some very high frequency. And they run that through a capacitor that smooths it out and makes the voltage that you want coming out. So the capacitors themselves have, have this very high power signal going into them that's switching on really fast at whatever the switching rate is. 
And, uh, and they're made out of you know, ceramic capacitors. So they sing, they have piezoelectric effects. So they create uh, this very intense, very high frequency vibration on the board. And what they discovered with this problem was this uh, singing capacitor piezoelectric effect was generating vibration that was, it was generating enough vibration that it was causing other components on the board to fail. And in particular, the, the, in order to, you need a, you need something to generate your steady switching signal at the precise frequency that you want. So you, we use, uh, uh, crystals are frequently used as this, as oscillator references. So like a, you know, when you have a quartz crystal in a watch that sets the time base, that's a little quartz tuning fork that vibrates at a certain frequency. So in this case, they're using a MEMS. Uh, it's, you know, it's a similar thing, but instead of being made out of quartz, it's made out of silicon and it generates the oscillation reference they have. Well, it's on the same board as the capacitors and the vibration the capacitors making is of course resonating because the, the capacitors are running at a frequency which is derived from the MEMS oscillator. So they're harmonic multiples of one another. So that energy is causing a resonance and the MEMS oscillators are failing. This is a really obscure problem <laughs> to try to debug. And so they're basically showing off like how, you know, how obscure a problem that they can get to. They're also emphasizing here that because of the power density requirement that it is, they don't have the luxury. In a lot of power supplies, what you can do is you can take your oscillator and you can move it someplace else because uh, you don't have to put it where the really hot stuff is. The oscillators are kind of fragile, so you can put them someplace that's like cool and in a better environment. In this case, they've got so much density that they can't move anything away from the heat source. Everything is bolted right there to the back of the die, getting really hot. And so they're getting these you know, failures due to this sort of obscure mechanism. Got it. Let's continue. Now, the solution to this problem is a multi-pronged approach. We can reduce the vibration by using soft terminal caps. We can update a, uh, our MEMS part with a lower Q factor from the out-of-plane direction. And we can also update our switching frequency, frequency to push the resonance further away from these sensitive bands. Now, in addition to the, to the density uh, at the system level, we've been making a lot of progress at the infra infrastructure level. Actually, James, why don't you uh, why don't you go back and can you explain um, these three solutions that they, they yeah, gave so, for the solution? Yeah, so the, they've got this problem where you have these MEMS oscillators and you have these capacitors, and they're both sitting on the same board pretty close to one another. And the and the and essentially, the, the this very high-frequency vibration the capacitors is making is resonating with the MEMS oscillator and causing it to crack and break. So there's a couple of different ways that you can go at, you know, eliminating that. So the first one is they went to a soft terminal capacitor. So what that does is the capacitor isn't as rigidly bonded to the board. So that soft terminal absorbs some of the vibration that is going from the capacitor down into the board. So that's one thing you can do. The other, the second thing they do is they switch to a different MEMS oscillator. The Q factor is essentially how susceptible that that uh, that MEMS oscillator is going to be to a resonance, like how how heavily it's going to be driven, uh, and so they went to a lower Q factor, which basically makes that the 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 MEMS oscillator less susceptible to having this noise injected into it and subsequently breaking. And then the other thing they do is they did a trick to move the frequency of the oscillator away from the frequency that the capacitors are, are singing at so that there'd be less likelihood of resonance. So probably each one of these is, uh, is a potential solution to the problem. So why did they do all three? Because this was a pain in the ass and they don't want to do it again, right? So they fixed it three different ways. Got it. And we can also update our switching frequency to push the resonance further away from these sensitive bands. Okay. Now, in addition to the, to the density uh, at the system level, we've been making a lot of progress at the infra infrastructure level. We knew that we had to re-examine every aspect of the data center infrastructure in order to support our unprecedented power and cooling density. We brought in a fully custom designed C CDU to support Dojo's dense cooling requirements. And the amazing part is we're able to do this at a fraction of the cost versus buying off the shelf and modifying it. And since our Dojo cabinet integrates enough power and cooling to match an entire row of standard IT racks, we need to carefully design our cabinet and infrastructure together. And we've already gone through several iterations of this cabinet to optimize this. And earlier this year, we started load testing our power and cooling infrastructure. And we were able to push it over two megawatts before we tripped our substation and got a call from the city. Hmm. Yeah. Now, last year, we introduced only a couple of components of our system. The co OK, so just to talk about the cabinet stuff. Um, uh, Two, two megawatts into, this is one cabinet. Remember now, Dojo's gonna be, when it's full up, it's gonna be 10 of these. 
and they're 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 basically stress testing the cabinet to be able to take two megawatts of power, which is a lot more power than goes into uh, your your typical compute. Uh, and, and so, because they have such so such huge power requirements, that also implies you're going to have huge cooling requirements because all the power that comes in it comes out as heat. Also, I mean, you do a certain amount of computation, but almost all of it comes back out. So you have 2.2 megawatts of power going into this cabinet, and they got 2.2 megawatts of heat coming out of each one of these ten cabinets. So they're building their own cooling infrastructure. Essentially, they're vertically integrating to build all of the infrastructure that supports these cabinets. So it's not like they just build this cabinet and the rest of the data center they can buy off the shelf because the energy intensity of the cabinets in Dojo is so high that they need to essentially build the whole stack themselves. Right. Custom D1 die and the training tile. But we tease the exapod as our end goal. We'll walk through the remaining parts of our system that are required to build out this exapod. Now, the system tray is a key part of realizing our vision of a single accelerator. It enables us to seamlessly connect tiles together, not only within the cabinet, but between cabinets. We can connect these tiles at very tight spacing across the entire accelerator, and this is how we achieve our uniform communication. This is a laminated bus bar that allows us to integrate very high power, mechanical and thermal support, and an extremely dense integration. It's 75 millimeters in height and, and supports six tiles at 135 kilograms. This is the equivalent of three to four fully loaded high performance racks. Next, we need to feed data to the training tiles. This is where we've developed the Dojo interface processor. It provides our system with high bandwidth DRAM to stage our training data. And it provides full memory bandwidth to our training tiles using TTP, our custom protocol that we can use to communicate across our entire accelerator. It also has high speed ethernet that helps us extend this custom protocol over standard ethernet. And we provide native hardware support for this with little to no software overhead. And lastly, we can connect, connect to it through a standard Gen 4 PCIe interface. Now, we pair 20 of these cards per tray, and that gives us 640 gigabytes of high bandwidth DRAM. And this provides our disaggregated memory layer for our training tiles. These cards are our high bandwidth ingest path, both through PCIe and Ethernet. They also provide a high rate XZ connectivity path that allows shortcuts across our large Dojo accelerator. So we'll talk a little bit about what he's showing us here. So now you, we've, you've, the tiles themselves are this sea of nodes fabric. Um, so it's capable of doing a, a huge amount of computation, but it's got very small warehouses on each one of those little factories that it's got. So you need to be able to feed parts into it for these computations at a really high rate, and you need to be able to offload the results at a really high rate. So you need what uh, you need an in ingest pathway. Ingest pathway is like it's all the hardware that that and all the software that basically is used to ingest data. Like imagine this is a jet engine. Ingestion is like the air coming into the front of the thing. It runs really fast. So you need a lot of really high bandwidth links to come into it. And the solution that that uh, that Tesla has gone with is uh, they basically have an interface uh, card. So each one of the die on each one of the tiles along the, uh, you know, so basically this tray is two by three. So the die at the edge of the two by side, you know, so there's uh, two tiles, they each have five die across. And so they have 10 cards where one card features each, feeds each die. And it has, I think, 800 gigabyte per second ability to feed data into the die at the end or pull data out of. And then, and then of course, data gets to other die by just clocking through the intermediate die. So it, it, that, it runs through the fabric at that point. So essentially, in order to be able to feed this machine and swap the, swap the program when you need to swap the program and take the results out at the pace that they come out of, you, need some, uh, you, need, you want something that has a, a big local memory and a really high speed connection to the end of the tile so you can keep it fed. And what they've got is these PCIe cards. They have a custom interface chip that goes on it that talks to each one of the tile, each one of the die. At the end of at the end of the tile, and it has, uh, what did he say? Six hundred forty gigabytes of uh, high speed DRAM on each one of these cards. So in the base, in the fully populated basic Dojo configuration, they've got six hundred forty gigabytes of bandwidth that they can feed into each one of the D one die at along the, you know, the the two by three sort of grid edge. Oh, and they have another set on the other side. So basically, you have you you know each one of these Dojo interface processors with its six hundred forty gig 
of memory and its 800 gig interface. It goes from the bottom, it goes up into the tile, and then it goes through three tiles, right? So say 15 D1 die. And then at the other end, there's another card. <laughs> so you can feed data in and take data out of both sides of this fabric. So when you're, when you're deciding what size, you know, how you want to put your job on the thing, you can you can build jobs that don't take an entire row of 15 die. Like you could have a smaller job and each one of those jobs would have an ingest pipeline that it could talk to on e either side. Go ahead, so, yeah, just real quick. So the, I already forgot the, the word they used, but the processor they essentially made, is that where you would say like the compiler or the OS that they're using for all this sits on? Um, where does the OS sit? That's interesting. That's got to sit somewhere, um, right? So, I mean, the D1s, they're going to have a BIOS on them that boots them up and gets them talking mm -hmm. to each other. So each one of them will have a small ROM that just basically gets it started. The uh, the code, the, I mean, the code that gets loaded into them, it'll be coming off of this card. So yeah, the operating okay. system is kind of a whole cluster level thing. But, you know, it has... Uh, bits of it that are going to run on each one of these uh, on each one of these uh, actually the D1 cards themselves aren't super smart they're mostly uh, DRAM uh, sorry uh, uh, a DMA interface to memory what we're going to see as this goes on is there's a host that sits underneath this thing that has uh, 500 uh, x86 cores and the operating system mostly is going to run on that stuff okay and and then that, so that makes a lot of sense so and then uh... I might be sounding stupid here, but I think I'm finally understanding what you said before. The obviously they're using DRAM for general memory storage, but mm -hmm. so are they using SRAM for what I would think of like L3 cache? Is that would that be kind of a synonymous way of thinking about it? So the dojo that that sea of nodes fabric itself, each one of the dojo die has 354 co cores on it in a in a in a square grid. Each one of those has 1.25 megabytes of SRAM on it. Now, that's all the mem working memory that the sea of nodes has is just gotcha. that SRAM. So uh, the software that runs on them needs to get, say, a continuous feed of weights or a continuous feed of samples it's using to train. And that needs to come from somewhere off the die because they can't store all of this bulk data that's being used. So that, that stuff will start out sitting in the memory on these cards and these cards will break it up as the processors need it. So the compiler ahead of time will decide for each one of those processors exactly what data it gets at exactly oh, what yeah. point. And that'll all be pre-programmed as the binary that runs on this. So each of the, so the, the thing underneath it knows, oh, this this particular you know node is going to be done at this point in time, and just in time for that, it's going to pull a shard of memory, it's going to pull a shard of data out of its memory, stick it in a DRAM, and send it through the interface. So just as that uh, as that node or as that die needs more data, here it is coming down the pipe. That's wild. If I could it's ask a, a question. It's a deterministic on... synchronous system, right? It's deterministic. Yeah. Like when you run a job, every single compute happens same. exactly as predicted. Um, and, you know, all of the data is is uh, scheduled to, to arrive just at the time that the processor yeah. is ready for it. And, and the compiler is scheduling all those cycles. Yeah. So the yeah. compiler does all this. So like your compiler on your x86, it doesn't have to, it needs to be about right, but it can be a little bit sloppy with that stuff because you know, the caching and the page tables and the, you know, the, the, um, uh, a lot of x86 processors, they can, if the instructions come in and they're slightly in the wrong order, they can actually do out of order execution. Like they can take, they can see a sequence of instructions and say, you know, it would be better if these two instructions were swapped, like it would run faster mm -hmm. and they will swap those two in the pipeline. They can do all kinds of tricks like that. And Dojo, it doesn't do any of that. The compiler has to figure out exactly what uh, is going to happen on every clock cycle on every single node and pre pre order everything. So it just runs in, you know, like this symphony. Got it. The, the one, 
a thing that I, I'm curious about, Dave, if you could pull up that uh, the slide we we're just looking at with the DRAM. Perfect. Thank you. So I'm, I'm assuming this is to scale somewhat, right? Like the yeah. physical. Yeah. Yes. So what are some of the optimizational like? So when I look at this, I'm like, OK, they have a super advanced thing on the top and it looks like they just have a bunch of RAM at the bottom, like off the shelf. What it was the chance that they can take that RAM and basically integrate it into the tray and double their ability to put twice the amount of trays in the same cabinet. Um, okay, so that so none of these cards are like commercial off the shelf things. These okay. are all custom yeah. made for Dojo. So that okay. those little green cards that you see, those are PCI cards. And in fact, if we let this run a little further, you'll see they stick a PCI you know box underneath it. Yeah. Um, that PCI. Uh, that, so there's a there's a chip that sits on the, that card that basically handles the Dojo interface. And then there's a bunch of memory soldered to that board, which uh, basically that chip pulls data out of that memory and feeds it through the Dojo interface. This is the Dojo interface processor uh, to Dojo, or it takes results out of Dojo and puts them back in that right. memory. So, uh, sorry, your question was, can they just double those? Well, can they? So, from a from a space like from a space perspective, would it be mm -hmm. unrealistic to take the, those cards and figure out how to fit them in a form factor so it's, it's just embedded in the tray? Because visually, what I'm thinking is, could they potentially double the amount of compute they have in each cabinet if they can just make that tray plus the memory form factor more? I don't know, just more dense. Again, I'm not I'm not familiar with the with the uh, like the technical. So prowess that's required to be able to do that because yeah, so that would the, mean double the power right the right. fabric density limitation is how many of the how close can you get those die together yeah and everything kind of falls out of that so okay. um these cards like if you wanted to have more memory you could build a card that has more memory on it and have the same kind of interface there's only so many interfaces you know each one of those d1 die has an interface and it can take in uh, i think it's uh, two terabytes per second at at the end when it's talking to other ones. So uh, it never makes sense to try to put more than two terabytes into it. I mean, they have 800 uh, gigabytes here, so they're not fully filling that pipe. They could, uh, let's see, do I have these numbers right? They could, be, they could conceivably put uh, a faster interface on, they could put more memory on, and they wouldn't need to change the form factor. To get increased density, you can go to, you know, the, the D1 die, there will be a D2 and a D3, and they'll have more nodes and they'll be bigger. Eventually they'll make bigger tiles. These tiles are five by five. They could go to eight by eight, 10 by 10, whatever. Like that's a, a way that they can scale. Up. When they do that, then you might need to improve the ingestion pipelines, depending on the size of jobs that you're, that you're running. If, if most of their jobs were just one, one die in size, like this wouldn't be a very efficient, uh, uh, way of going at it because right. like the die in the middle of the sea, they have to get their data through the other die, right? Yeah, this yeah, approach yeah. mainly makes sense for problems where at least you're using at least a good part of a row of die, five, 10, that kind of number. Cause you've got one ingestion pipeline for that whole, you know, strip of compute and you're just feeding part of the results. And, you know, if, if you, if your um, factory for processing data is 10 die and I have a fast pipe into the end of one and I can range the problem. So this one's output goes to this one, this one's output. Then um, I only need to feed the die on the end because it's output goes to the next guy and so on. I don't need to talk directly to some guy in the middle. If I did need to talk to some guy directly in the middle and incidentally, that's why this thing is long and skinny. This sea of nodes isn't a square C. It's a long skinny C mm. because the long edge has inputs all along the top and all along the bottom. So that tiles, none of, no die, none of the D1 dies is more than seven hops away from being able to get to an ingest, to an ingest. But to be able to use that efficiently, you would like your jobs to need at least seven die. Got it. Thank you. Seven die, why seven die? Well, there's 15, right? Yeah. So yeah. if you're the I'm middle, sorry. if you're the middle guy, you got seven on one side and seven on the other side. So, uh, for instance, okay. if you had two jobs, one was seven and one was eight, you could put both of them in the same strip. Mm, okay. Um, but the thing is, if say you had two jobs uh, and they both only needed three die, right? Well, you know, if I put three on one side and three on the other side, I got a bunch of die in the middle that aren't getting used, and that's wasted compute, right? So normally uh, you're not going to want to do that. Of course. 
if I had a job that had that needed like a 13 die, then I could put one with two die on the opposite end, right? So I'd Got be it. using a whole strip of 15. So so with these Dojo interface processors, basically they can they can load but also take the data from either side, right? Yeah, of the tray. And then okay, so what if so in, in the easiest thing to, if there's a, a job that requires 15 die, you just load it on one side and it comes out the other side or something, right? What if sure. you're needing a job that requires 30 die? Do you just take the right, first two rows. Two, two rows of that tray? And or I guess it it'd through? be columns. Since we saw yeah. the thing, it was like okay. 15 in a column by, yeah. I forgot, you know, 600 or something, right? Got it. When do you, when would you just take like a, would you take a single column of an entire sea of nodes ever, or would you just just use kind of the 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 tray the tray section first? You you are, did, were you asking if you'd use a whole row? Yeah, or, in like the sea now, of nodes. Normally, what you're going to do is you're going to try to adjust the things by columns because your input and your output are along the upper and lower edges of that C. So if you want lots of IO for your job, you're gonna make it you know, vertical or tending to square as Got you it. fill up you know, columns. Okay. Yeah, stay within the cabinet. Yeah, yeah, you stay within the tray first, I guess. Yeah, yeah. okay, makes sense. Yeah, all right, let's continue on. <laughs> this is getting <laughs> crazier and crazier. Are we doing, are we too, doing yeah. on, uh, are we like halfway through the video? I'm curious, like how far? Yeah, yeah we're, we're, we're more than, we're more than halfway through. Um, That's fun. Yeah, yeah, so. And, I would have um, laughed during the first like five minutes still. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 don't worry. <laughs> That'd be amazing. Okay. Now we actually integrate the host directly underneath our system tray. These hosts provide our ingest processing and connect to our interface processors through PCIe. These hosts can provide hardware and video decoder support for video-based training. And our user applications land on these hosts that we, so we, we can provide them with a standard x86 Linux environment. Now we can put two of these assemblies into one cabinet and pair it with redundant power supplies that do direct conversion of three-phase 480-volt AC power to 52-volt DC power. Now by focusing on density at every level, we can realize the vision of a single accelerator. Now, starting with the uniform nodes on our custom D1 die, we can connect them together in our fully integrated training tile, and then finally, seamlessly connecting them across cabinet boundaries to form our Dojo accelerator. And altogether, we can house two full accelerators in our Exapod for a combined one Exaflop of ML compute. Now, altogether, this amount of technology and integration has only ever been done a couple of times in the history of compute. Next, we'll see how software can leverage this to accelerate their performance. Thanks, Bill. My name is Rajiv, and I'm going to talk some numbers. So our software stack begins with the PyTorch extension that speaks to our commitment to run standard PyTorch models out of the box. We're going to talk more about our JIT compiler and the ingest pipeline that feeds the hardware with data. Abstractly, performance is tops times utilization times accelerator occupancy. We've seen how the hardware provides peak performance. It's the job of the compiler to extract utilization from the hardware while code is running on it. And it's the job of the ingest pipeline to make sure that data can be fed at a throughput high enough for the hardware to not ever starve. So let's talk about why communication-bound models are difficult to scale. But before that, let's look at why Resident 50-like models are easier to scale. You start off with a single accelerator, run the forward and backward passes, followed by the optimizer. Then to scale this up, you run multiple copies of this on multiple accelerators. And while the gradients produced by the backward pass do need to be reduced, and this introduces some communication, this can be done pipeline with the backward pass. OK, so we're, mo we're moving into the software compiler part of the talk. Um, this was, ResNet is like the standard benchmark kind of, uh, it, it's unfortunately, it's not a good benchmark for really big things, but it's a benchmark that gets used on all kinds of stuff. So it's a, so it's a useful benchmark to kind of talk about the, we're, we're getting into a part of the talk where he, um, this gentleman is, uh, is, is telling us how, when you, you know, when you take a job and you start to scale it across multiple nodes, what are the problems that you run into with coordinating these nodes and moving data back and forth between it? And he's starting by telling us about ResNet models, like how they would scale, even though they're not a great representative example there, it's a good place to start talking about the, about the challenges. And then later he'll go on to bigger things and talk about how uh, Dojo deals with those on bigger problems. This setup scales fairly well, almost linearly. Okay, sorry, that's worth looking at a minute. So when I was talking about, um, let's get back to that graph a second. Okay, so this is a linearly scaling, this is an example of a linearly scaling problem, which is this, gra this graph is like, how, how, how fast is my 
is my training going? And along the bottom here, this is like how many GPUs or, or D1 dies or nodes am I using? You can see it goes like eight, 16, 24, 32 or whatnot. And you can see on this line, you know, when you double the number of, of uh, units that you're using, it gets exactly twice as fast. So this is, a, this is a problem that scales really well. If I buy twice the computer, the problem runs twice as fast. This setup scales fairly well, almost linearly. For models with much larger activations, we run into a problem as soon as we want to run the forward pass. The batch size that fits in a single accelerator is often smaller than the batch norm surface. So to get around this, researchers typically run the setup on multiple accelerators in sync batch norm mode. This introduces latency-bound communication to the critical path of the forward pass, and we already have a communication bottleneck. OK. So. Uh, when you run big, uh, a, a lot of neural network models, they require um, normalization. Or they, they, they have, there's various kinds of processes where you can't just like let each, each uh, unit run independently. There's a point where they all have to coordinate. So a classic one, which is kind of difficult, is, is, this, uh, is this kind of normalization process. Uh, normalization is, is a way to regularize data that goes into the neural network to basically make it so that when you're training, your gradients are smoother. So you get a more predictable training curve. So batch normalization is one of those. Now, the thing about batch normalization is that what you, the batch normalization is I have a bunch of training examples and I'm going to run those training examples through my network. And at a certain point inside the network, I'm gonna take what all of the different training examples output and I'm gonna average that together. In fact, I'm gonna take, I'm gonna figure out what the average and the standard deviation is. And I'm gonna renormalize the values at that point to feed them through. And the point is so that you get a kind of similar signal for everything that comes after that, regardless of which sample that comes in. Okay, the problem with this is that if you have a decent sized batch of data going through, you have to stop your neural network at that point. And then all of the different processors, they have to exchange their results, right? So you gotta stop. And so this is a great place to like become communication bound, right? That you, uh, uh, so, uh, you know, essentially, when you get to the batch normalization phase of running through your through your neural network, like everything has to stop, and then uh, you essentially all of the data has to go to one place so that one of these processors can you know calculate the mean, the mean and standard deviation for every sample every processor saw, and then it once it does that, it has to send that back to them so that they can continue on. So uh, uh, essentially, we're gonna he's gonna walk us through like how does Dojo deal with this and and how effective is it in that situation? Does that all make sense? Yeah, j just to make sure I'm understanding this because it may not mm -hmm. be. So essentially, we use X amount of cores to do a certain process, and obviously that goes across you know, many, many cores, right? And so right. at a certain point, everyone does their job and all that has to set to get compiled to one set of amount of compute on ideally one node, if you will. And then from there, once we've compiled it, we need to send it back to everything to continue or to fix whatever we didn't get done. Yeah, I probably wouldn't use the word compile. Essentially, what oh, yeah, we're doing no, is we're, yeah. we're aggregating a bunch of results. Aggregating. There you go, yeah. And then, okay. and then uh, so essentially, you know, you say you've got you know a bunch of a bunch of nodes and and I've I've parallelized this model so I have strips of these processors and each one is processing its own um, its own sample of of its own example from a batch of data that I'm running through. Well, so they so they propagate through up up to a certain point, but at a certain point inside the neural network, the neural network wants to know the previous input from its own, but it also wants to know what the previous input is from every other one of the, of the of, you know, essentially I'm sharding a job. Instead of running my job on one processor, I'm trying to run it yeah. faster by running parts of it on different processors. But because of the way the job is split up, there are certain places where every processor has to talk to every other processor. Or essentially you take all the results from all the processors at a certain stage of the neural network training as you're working, and they all come to one place, they get averaged and you calculate the standard deviation, and then that result goes back to all the units and then they can keep going. So this is a batch norm requires this, and it's a it you know it's a it's one of the things that can make neural networks are pretty easy to parallelize in general. But this is a process that you know if you need it in your neural network, it's the kind of thing where the whole supercomputer stops and they all trade values, and then you get to keep going again. So if your communication is slow, this kills you, right? How important is this process? Like, is there a way in, is there, maybe I'm thinking about this incorrectly, but 
does this step of sort of having to talk to each other to essentially verify or or allow each node to continue with the work is that something that has to happen or is it bound by the software expertise of today help me understand a little bit better uh yeah no that's a great point um people try hard to not use this if they're going to run on a cluster because it is a problem for clusters um and to some extent you can get rid of it but what we find is that uh, for certain kinds of models, if you put it in, they train faster and you get better results. So uh, there's uh, people use as little of it as they can get away with, but it's kind of a, a quick and dirty hack. Like if, you're, if you've got a model and it's not converging very well, like the inputs are kind of noisy and it's not consistently running. Well, you can, this is batch norm is something that you can toss in that will smooth the training process out. So you're less likely to have regressions You're less, you know, you can make more consistent progress. So the question is like, what's the trade off there? So there are other things you can do. You can slow down the learning rate. You can change the way you process data. You can change the architecture and people do all of these things to try to avoid batch norm. But sometimes at the end of the day, batch norm is still the best way to get the job done. Got it. So you take a little penalty on speed, but your quality, I don't know, yeah. five X's or whatever. You just get or, good. Or it might data. be that it converges faster. So like, or converges you know, faster. it might be that it was going to take you, you know, X cycles. And if you use batch norm, it takes X over uh, two. So the question is, is batch norm, is, is it, is it going to end up taking more time at half the cycles or you know, that kind of thing? So it, it the, the trade-off is pretty complicated on these kinds got of it. things, but they, you know, Tesla's bringing it up. Apparently they're still using batch norm, right? And a lot of people do, especially on really big imaging models. It's a, it's a pretty common bugabear that, 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 that people have to work through. Anyway, so it turns cool. out it's a really good example for him to show how the compiler, you know, can anticipate and deal with this kind of problem. And while there are ways to get around this, they usually involve tedious manual work best suited for a compiler. And ultimately, there's no skirting around the fact that if your state does not fit in a single accelerator, you can be communication bound. And even with significant effort. Okay, so now he's showing us like this is what the the Tesla models are they're running right now, how they scale, right? So you can see if you start with one node, mm. right, you get this speed, and you go to two, and then you go to four or whatever, you go to eight, and already when you go from four to eight, you can see they're not getting a doubling of speed suddenly, right? As soon as you as soon as you go from running from running it in four processes to running it in eight processes and then you get to 16 right now you go to 32 and like 32 is nowhere near twice as fast as 16 you can see they're way into diminishing returns as you break this up into more slices and this is the problem like if you run on a conventional cluster you know this is the kind of thing that you see as 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 your job gets big enough that it doesn't fit in one GPU and then eventually doesn't fit in one box or doesn't fit in one rack, you get these incremental slowdowns as more and more communication gets involved. What from our do engineers, think? we see such models Sorry. don't scale linearly. The Dojo system was built to make such models work at high utilization. The high density integration is, was built to not only accelerate the compute bound portions of a model, but also the latency bound portions like a batch norm or the bandwidth bound portions like a gradient all reduce or a parameter all gather. Okay, so just a point on this diagram right here, you can see we've got our sea of nodes and it's three tiles by however many racks there are. It's a, you know, there's a total of 120 of these tiles. And he, they're showing us right here, like here's your host. These, these are the Dojo interface processors that sit underneath it. And then here's your three tiles, right? And then at the other end, you've got another host with another Dojo interface processor. So when you run a job, if you run, if you run a job that needs, um, say, 25 tiles, and you have another job you compare it with, with it needs, sorry, 25 die versus 50 die. Well, here's 25 die and here's 50. So maybe one job would go in these 20, in, on this tile and you'd pair it with another job that you were gonna run simultaneously on the other side. And then this host, an interface processor would feed this tile, and then this one would feed these two tiles. Does that make that's what we were talking about before in terms of yeah. like how you're going to, um, Tetris, you know, puzzle Tetris. piece your jobs into the fabric yeah. to keep the fabric busy. A slice of the dojo mesh can be carved out to run any model. The only thing you just need to do is to make the slice large enough to fit a bathroom surface for their particular model. After that, the partition presents itself as one large accelerator the users from having to worry about the internal details of execution. And it's the job of the compiler to maintain this abstraction. 
So essentially what he's telling us here is that what the compiler does is you, you've got this job, you want to run it, um, and, you, and the first thing you do is you decide, well, how, how many tiles am I going to use or how many die am I going to use? And then uh, what the compiler does is it basically takes that set of tilers. And like, in this case, we have 9 times 25. Is this right? 75. So this is 225 die that's going to be used as a single accelerator. So when the compiler compiles the job, it basically starts with, okay, I'm going to compile a job that takes these, that takes nine, uh, uh, that takes nine dojo, dojo, dojo tiles, and thus it has six interface processors and six hosts on the thing. And I'm going to build a binary for this machine. And so you'd be able to run that on any subset of the fabric, which is this shape. So each time, maybe uh, the accelerator, is that a one-to-one -one relationship to how many problems you have to solve? So like, say you have, I need to solve for this problem. Is that one accelerator or is that the right way of, th of thinking about it? Yeah, so one one piece of code, you um, so say you, you've got one, you've, you have a neural network that you're gonna train, you know, and that it has, you know, an architecture, a set of weights, a set of training data that you're going to use, and you're gonna run that as one job, Yeah. okay? so. Uh, so that one job becomes one accelerator. Now, this is when you have, you know, the way that these compilers work, um, say I have a box sitting on my desk, you know, it's a super micro box and it's got eight GPUs in it, right? Most of the frameworks out there that, I, that I'm going to use to train on this thing, what they're going to do is they're going to build a piece of code and they're going to say, oh, I have eight accelerators. And, and what the... Uh, you know, because each one of those GPUs will be an accelerator. So that uh, the piece of software that sets up the, the job to run on that box, it has to think about, okay, I've got eight. What do I put on this one? What do I put on this uh -huh. one? What do I put on this one? How do they talk? You have to figure all that stuff out. So the Dojo fabric, because it's basically seamless, you know, you can treat it as essentially just a seamless sea of nodes. What you do is you just slice off a piece like it's a piece of pie, and you treat it like one accelerator, right? right so right. from the from the standpoint of the person who's using it, you know, you write your PyTorch code, you have your PyTorch code, and you just have like, you know, I have a Dojo accelerator, and it's this size, and that's all I need to know about because the compiler and everything underneath that, it's going to deal with all the details. Got it. Yeah, the, I think the way I'm finally like went off in my head. Thank you. Yeah. The way I'm understanding this is that you have a certain job to run, and we're going to allow the compiler to ex essentially just abstract all the hardware. So that job that runs isn't aware that we have all this hardware. The compiler's job is to worry about that. The job's just going to do the job. Yeah. So right. it's almost, it's, it's almost like just it. virtualizing it. So you're not aware of what's underneath. Yeah, it. exactly. Fine-grained synchronization primitives and uniform low latency makes it easy to accelerate all forms of parallelism across integration boundaries. Tensors are usually stored sharded in SRAM and replicated just in time for layers execution. We depend on the high Dojo bandwidth to hide this replication time. Tensor replication and other data transfers are overlapped with compute, and the compiler can also recompute layers when it's profitable to do so. We expect most models to work out of the box. As an example, we took the recently released stable diffusion model and got it running on Dojo in minutes. Out of the box, the compiler was able to map it in a model parallel manner on 25 Dojo guys. OK, so this, so stable diffusion, I don't know if you guys have, have heard this thing. This is a, um, Stable Diffusion is a model that was released uh, a, a few weeks before uh, Tesla AI Day. And uh, it's an open source model that does kind of what Dolly does and whatnot, where it it, uh, it connects a text, a, a language model to an imaging model, and it lets you type in a prompt, and then it does it, it takes its its best shot at, uh, at making an image uh, uh, across this thing. So, uh, so the, the point of what they're talking about right here is like they took this essentially totally novel piece of code, which wasn't designed. It could not possibly have been designed with Dojo in mind, right? It's just a model that somebody developed from, you know, to solve some particular problem. And then they mapped it onto a single die and the compiler, you know, they said they got it running in minutes. So presumably they didn't have to mess with it very much. They took this Python code that it was, that was publicly released. It's not a trivial model. A stable diffusion is a pretty large model. It's pretty complicated. It's got all kinds of funky stuff going on inside. And yet their compiler is mature enough that they were able to do a compile run, dump it on Dojo and it ran. So this is them basically saying, this is the level of maturity of our tools. And this is the degree of power that they have today. How, how does that compare to GPT-3? Because I remember last year, I think that's what they kind of did the test on. So is this more advanced or less? 
So GPT-3 is 175 billion parameters. It is a really big, really, really big model. It'd be interesting for them to, to sl toss GPT-3 on this. Uh, stable diffusion is much smaller. Um, I think it's on the order of a couple of billion parameters, right? So it's like 100x smaller or 50x smaller than, uh, than GPT-3 is. Uh, and but and it's also worth noting that they put it on one tile. Yeah. So it's possible the compiler works great on one tile right now, but it's not working as well across tiles. Although that seems unlikely. Um, essentially, they have this uh, because the architecture is this sea of nodes kind of thing. That it you know it should work fine across tiles. Like there there's not a lot of uh, of uh, stuff to worry about in between. But you do get kind of this slowdown when you cross tile boundaries. So. You know, if you if you have a process and you can run it in fewer than 25 uh, die, you probably want to, right? You probably don't want to go bigger because the speed slowdown you get going there, the, it doesn't slow down a lot. There's a, it's 2x slower to go from one die in one tile to an adjacent die in another tile than it is to go between two die in the same tile. So to the extent that you can stay inside a tile, there's some advantage to it. Mm -hmm. Here's some pictures of a Cybertruck on Mars generated by Stable Diffusion running on Dojo. Looks, <laughs> looks like it still has some ways to go before matching the Tesla Design Studio team. So we've talked about how communication bottlenecks can hamper scalability. Perhaps an acid test of a compiler and the underlying hardware is executing a cross die bash room layer. Like mentioned before, this can be a serial bottleneck. The communication phase of a batch run begins with nodes computing their local mean and standard deviations, then coordinating to reduce these values, then broadcasting these values back, and then they resume their work in parallel. So the diagram, we're, we're, we're back to talking about batch norm. Um, so batch norm, this, this, uh, this mu sigma thing is essentially you know, the mean and standard deviation, which is what batch norm calculates. So you've got these five processors, they're all doing their thing, but at some point they have to calculate a mu sigma for you know, for where they are in the network. And then they all, they have to exchange it all. So one, one common way of doing this is they all send all their results to one processor that then aggregates all of them and then it sends them back, right? So here you are, you, you do your separate mu sigmas in your five separate processes. They all go to one processor, it puts them all together and then it sends them back to the original five processors, right? So what would an ideal batch form look like on 25 dojo dice? Let's say the previous list activations are, are already split across dice. We would expect the 350 nodes on each die to coordinate and produce die local mean and standard deviation values. Ideally, these would get further reduced with the final value ending somewhere in, towards the middle of the tile. We would then hope to see a broadcast of this value radiating from the center. Let's see how the compiler actually executes a real batch ROM operation across 25 dice. Okay, so what he's telling us here is like, you know, each one of these die has 354 nodes in it, and each one of them is running part of the process, right? So at some point, all of the 354 nodes on this die are going to pause, they're going to calculate their batch norm results, and then they're going to want to exchange them with every other processor and all of these. So what would that look like in an ideal case? Well, ideally, what you would do is like the first thing, each one of these die, all 354 uh, die would send all, sorry, all 354 nodes would calculate their own local result and then send it to a single node on that thing that would aggregate all the ones in that in that one die. Then they would send it, uh, then they would all send them to a single die where that would aggregate them. They would get sent back out to the separate die, and then they would be further redistributed from a single node on the die to all of the others. So what they're gonna do is is show us what their what their debugger says the 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 flow of these results is through it. And then and of course the question is like how close it does is what the compiler comes up with to our idealization of like what would be the perfect way to do this. The communication trees were extracted from the compiler and the timing is from a real hardware one. We're about to see 8,750 nodes on 25 dies coordinating to reduce and then broadcast the batch mean and standard deviation values. Die local reduction followed by global reduction towards the middle of the tie, then the reduced value broadcast radiating from the middle, accelerated by the hardware's broadcast facility. So does that make sense? Yeah, perfectly. It does. Okay. This operation takes only five microseconds on 25 dojo dice. Okay, so and here, here we are back to the, um, so here's why dojo is good, <laughs> right? So dojo basically does a batch norm across 25 dojo die. And uh, 
and essentially doing the batch norm and redistributing the results results in a five microsecond pause in the process of getting this stuff go. If you're running on 24 GPUs, they have to, you know, you 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 have much slower links. You have to send all this data through. And when you get back, at the end of the day, it's 150 microseconds, right? So we have a 30x speed up relative to running on GPUs for this batch norm job because the because the the D ones in the tile are much more tightly coupled than you can couple GPUs. The same operation takes 150 microseconds on 24 GPUs. This is an orders of magnitude improvement over GPUs. And while we talked about an all reduced operation in the context of a batch norm, it's important to reiterate that the same advantages apply to all other communication primitives. And these primitives are essential for large scale training. So how about full model performance? So while we think that ResNet 50 is not a good representation of real world Tesla workloads, it is a standard benchmark, so let's start there. We are already able to match the A100 die for die. However, perhaps a hint of Dojo's capabilities is that we're able to hit this number with just a batch of eight per die. But Dojo was really built to tackle larger complex models. So when we set out to tackle real-world workloads, we looked at the usage patterns of our current GPU cluster. And two models stood out, the auto-labeling networks, a class of offline models that are used to generate ground truth, and the occupancy networks that you heard about. The auto-labeling networks are large models that have high arithmetic intensity, while the occupancy networks can be ingest bound. We chose these models because together they account for a large chunk of our current GPU cluster usage, and they would challenge the system in different ways. So we, we are getting uh, some a little bit of interesting data about what uh, about what Tesla is currently doing inside their data centers. They're, they're showing us that um, that of the of all the stuff they run on their cluster right now, a quarter of it is auto labeling, a quarter of it is occupancy network, uh, you know, training, and then and other. <laughs> yeah. So how do we do on these two networks? The results we're about to see were measured on multi die systems for both the GPU and Dojo, but normalized to per die numbers. On our auto-labeling network, we're already able to surpass the performance of an A100 with our current hardware running on our older generation VRMs. On our production hardware with our newer VRMs, that translates to doubling the throughput of an A100. And our models show that with some key compiler optimizations, we could get to more than 3x the performance of an A100. We see even bigger leaps on the occupancy network. Almost 3x with our production hardware, with room for more. Does this, is this uh, self-explanatory? Okay, so how are they testing this? I mean, you are saying per die, obviously, I mean, one die is not gonna be able to run all their auto labeling or right. occupancy. So how much, how big of a dojo okay, setup yeah. are they testing the, it on? This is, the, this is the performance per, uh, compared on a per die. These jobs aren't running on single die. Okay. So they're basically saying, how much performance are we getting when you divide it by the number of die that we're using, as opposed to running it on a cluster of A100s and comparing that to those number of die. So for instance, they're basically saying, right. comparing um, say, you know, 10 D1 die to 10 GPUs, what's the relative performance? Yeah, but they're not telling us exactly how many Dojo dies or right. tiles. They're taking using, the right? performance and they're dividing it by however yeah. many D1s they used. And then on the A100 jobs, they're taking that performance and dividing it by however many A100s they used. Got it. And then they're comparing so, so. that, you know, you know, per, you know, uh, A100 per D1 to each other. Right. Got it. So, so it doesn't, so 3.2 X on the auto labeling doesn't mean that it's necessarily, they're compiling that information or they're going through those uh, uh, calculations three, 0.2 times faster, it, we need to know how many D1 dies they're using in order to understand what their, what the future, say Q1 2023 uh, amount of uh, things they're going to be able to solve uh, unless we knew how many they're going to use, right, for those specific tasks. Because theoretically, they could be using, yeah. So these are their production workloads he mentioned. So like yeah. whatever job they're currently running. So this is Tesla basically saying, okay, so now we showed you on some benchmarks, right? Now let's take something that we actually use in today. That's a, pro mm -hmm. a job that we actually run and let's run it on some Dojo and let's run it on some A100s and compare the results that we get. And the basis that they're doing this on is they're comparing like, um, on a per no on a per die level, which means they're comparing, for instance, um, you know, 20, 24 D1 die to 24 GPUs. Yeah. And in fact, yeah. it would be like, because you partition it differently, GPUs, you're typically going to go, you know, because you have eight in a box, you want to go eight, 16, 24, 32, like that'll be the, the stuff you do on the, the, the dojo die. It's like, you know, 25, 50, 75, because that's how big your tiles are. So mm -hmm. they don't want to do the thing where they're comparing 25 dojos to say, you know, 16 
Uh, so what they do is they take the dojo results and they divide them by 25 and they take the, you know, if they're using 16 A100s, they take the 16, the a, that, and they divide it by 16. So they're having kind of an apples to apples com, uh, comparison because they're basically saying if we had a certain number of D1 die and we had the same number of A100s, like how would these two compare to each other? Got it. Make sense? Ooh. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, basically but, okay. if we look at auto, go ahead. A quick question. So, but... If it was a large job, wouldn't the performance of the GPUs, GPUs degrade or because you yeah, had yeah. the interconnect issues? But see, but what the they're saying is like they took their auto labeling job, which is yeah. a job they use, and it takes a certain amount of resources to run one task of it, right? They don't tell us how many it is. So we don't yeah. know if it's 30 GPUs or 300 GPUs. And we don't know if it's, you know, if it's five dojo tiles or 25 mm. dojo tiles they're not telling yeah. us that but yeah. they're they're basically saying how much bang for the buck am i getting for each dojo tie die versus for each to just give you something to sort of compare you know yeah. a cluster of a certain size to a certain number of tiles mm -hmm. got it got it so so, so the uh, volume this, of d1 chips is really going to dictate how how much faster they're going to be next year versus this year in computing in computing uh, things in the neural net, essentially. It's it's highly dependent on how many of these tiles they can produce, essentially. Yeah, and you know how many you can string together. I mean, their, their current design yeah. lets them string 120 tiles together, you know, and they yeah. are in this, you know, three tiles by, you know, uh, the, a tray is, uh, is two columns, a box is four columns, and so you get, what, 40 columns in, in 10 boxes. Of stuff yeah. like there is a certain shape to it, and they're ba they're essentially assuming that's a constraint on, on the way we look at this. Because you could imagine that for auto labeling, it might be that instead of having you know three by however many, like ideally it would be like six by however many, like that might be the optimal setup. But the box they have right now is the box they have, so they're comparing their existing cluster with its characteristics to their existing dojo with its characteristics and, and essentially normalizing the results by how many D1 die are used and how many GPUs are used in the cluster to, to, get, a, to get a comparison. And they're, they're basically telling us that today, you know, their current dojo hardware and compiler is a 1.3x advantage for dojo versus the a100 so you could say well we can do the same thing that the cluster can do and we can do it with 1.3 times fewer d1 tiles if, mm -hmm. if you know if, if that and then and so that would you know be latency and and all the other things into and then uh they're they're extrapolating they're basically estimating based on these results that with the uh, with the production hardware they expect to have in uh, Q1 of 2023, that they'd actually it'd, be, it'd actually be closer to two x, and that um, when they have that production thing and they have the production compiler, because apparently the compiler they're using right now doesn't have all the features they plan to put into it, they would be at 3.2 x. So once you have this number running on some real hardware with your current compiler, you can make pretty good guesses at these other two. So these these uh, these bottom two bars, this light gray bar is an actual measurement. And the other two bars are extrapolations from that measurement. Got it. Did yeah, they, did it they seems... Tesla ever share how many, G I'm sorry, Nick, just one real oh, quick no, one. Go, Did go, they go. ever share um, how many GPUs are actually used? Was that 10,000 GPU number, how many they actually are using today? So they have a cluster that has 10,000 G. So what they said was they're using 4K for auto labeling and they're using 10,000 for neural network training. Okay. So this, in the auto labeling job here, you know, this auto labeling job is less than 4,000. Now they can run multiple auto labeling jobs at the same time, right? So it might be that an auto labeling pass takes, you know, 10 boxes and they, you know, which would be uh, 80 GPUs. So, you know, if you've got 4,000, you can run a bunch of those simultaneously. Got it. Sorry, Nick. Oh, you're good. And then, good. then they do the same thing. So they took two jobs, you know, occupancy network was about half of, uh, it's about a quarter of their total uh, data center bandwidth. Auto labeling is about a quarter. And they show us, uh, you know, they basically say when they run the occupancy network right now, they're getting about 1.6 A100s worth of work for each D1 die. And that, you know, extrapolating from those results, they would get to maybe, you know, 2.9x next Q1 when they get the when they get the hardware fully updated, and then maybe 4.4 when they have both the hardware and the updated compiler. Got it. That's pretty significant, by the way. <laughs> yeah.
So what does that mean for Tesla? With the current level of compiler performance, we could replace the ML compute of one, two, three, four, five, and six GPU boxes with just a single dojo tile. Okay. Yeah, it's actually finished this guy. And this dojo tile costs less than one of these GPU boxes. Okay, so these are super micro eight by uh, A180 gigabyte boxes, which I understand run about 175,000 bucks a piece. I think Naveen Rao told me you can get them for 150 if you buy them in bulk or something. So that's the scale of the cost here. So he's basically telling us that, you know, this is 150 to 200,000 bucks for them to make a tile. And it replaces six times uh, that, that much in, in boxes. So not only are they getting a performance speed up, right? They're getting a pretty significant cost advantage. So each one of these is eight die. So six times eight. So this would be 48. Um, 48 A100s in this stack of boxes here, and they've got 25, so two to one, something like that. They're expecting to get, and uh, and at a six x reduction in cost. Yeah, and Whoa. all the power, everything. <laughs> what did we actually, you know, the that D1 tile is so crazily power intensive, it might not be a power savings. <laughs> I oh, think really? it's like a 20% power savings. It's not like a six times power savings, but those super micro box, remember that um, that dojo tile is eating like, you know, kilowatts by itself. Uh, and those, eh, yeah, those, as those super micro boxes are probably a kilowatt. Oh, but the, the D1, uh, the D1, a single tile is probably like 20 kilowatts. 15 or 20, 25 kilowatts, something like that. And those, those super micro boxes are probably a couple of kilowatts a piece, just maybe three kilowatts. What it really means is that networks that took more than a month to train now take less than a week. Alas, when we measured things, it did not turn out so well. At the PyTorch level, we did not see our expected performance out of the gate. And this timeline chart shows our problem. The teeny tiny little green bars, that's the compile code running on the accelerator. The row is mostly white space where the hardware is just waiting for data. With our dense ML compute, Dojo hosts effectively have 10x more ML compute than the GPU hosts. The data loaders running on this one host simply couldn't keep up with all that ML hardware. So to solve our data loader scalability issues, we knew we had to get over the limit of this single host. The Tesla transport protocol moves data seamlessly across hosts, tiles, and ingest processors. So we extended the Tesla transport protocol to work over Ethernet. We then built the Dojo network interface card, the DNIC, to leverage TTP over Ethernet. This allows any host with a DNIC card to be able to DMA to and from other TTP endpoints. So we started with the Dojo mesh, then we added a tier of data loading hosts equipped with the DNIC card. We connected these hosts to the mesh via an Ethernet switch. Now every host in this data loading tier is capable of reaching all TTP endpoints in the Dojo mesh via hardware accelerated DMA. After these optimizations went in, our occupancy went from 4% to 97%. So the data loading sections have reduced. The data loading sections have reduced drastically, and the ML hardware is kept busy. We actually expect this number to go to 100% pretty soon. After these changes went in, we saw the full expected speed up from the PyTorch layer, and we were back in business. OK, so uh, he, so now we're talking about another layer of networking that Dojo has and why they need it and what sort of results it gets. So in the first slide, it, there's so we see this diagram, this top diagram that says it says 4% occupancy ingest performance. So this is, um, uh, in the first version, um, they're trying to basically load data and load code into these processors to keep them busy. And the 4% hardware occupancy, that is of the, uh, how, how much of the time is my hardware busy doing the stuff that I want to. And because they had limitations in with, uh, with just using the fabric and the, and the uh, Dojo interface processors to, to feed data into and distribute it across the fabric, they were only able to get uh, essentially 4% of the theoretical speed that they could get out of the network. And that, that presented a problem for them. So they added another sort of communication uh, mechanism to this, which is the, those, those, those Dojo interface processors also have an ethernet interface on them. And they can exchange data but with all of the others through an, through an Ethernet switch. So for instance, if you've got something, if you're, say that you, you know, we talked about how the Dojo interface processors, they, they feed like a column of, of die. So you've got two Dojo processors and you have 15 die in between. And the die 
are connected across to other die as you work your way across this. But what if you've got some stuff in column one and it's got to get to column eight? You know, you've got like a big enough job that stuff has to hop that way across it to. Well, now it has to move. Uh, it would have to move all through the tiles horizontally to, to go to move from one of those columns to another because the communication across either has to go um, it, you know, basically flowing through the fabric, you have to take a significant amount of your traffic bandwidth and latency in order to move that stuff across. And this becomes an obstacle. So what they've, so what they added was basically another layer of high bandwidth ethernet connections that connects all the dojo interface processors together. So a row can basically send something to their interface processor and it can hop via ethernet to another interface processor and make its way into the fabric after that. So, this is slow compared to hopping to your next neighbor in the tiles, but it's fast compared to having to go seven, seven neighbors over for the, for the parts of the code, for the, the parts of the system. So for instance, when you're initially loading a job into the thing, that's a thing that happens. You don't feed the code all the way through. You wanna feed it at, to the extent you can directly to the processors. So once they implement this ethernet layer on top of the fabric that they have between the Dojo interface processors, they're able to go from 4% utilization to 97% utilization. Hey, two, two quick questions for you on this. Mm -hmm. So are you saying each rack essentially has a top rack switch that all those ethernets are plugging into? Uh, there would be a switch someplace and they don't tell us wh where it is and we don't see it. The dip processors, so you remember there were the tiles, they had those PCI cards underneath them. Yeah. Those are the Dojo interface processors. So um, actually, I don't know for sure that if they have the, if the ethernet interface is on that or if it's separately on the host, but essentially they've got a set of high speed ethernet interfaces um, that, you know, essentially at the dip layer that, a lot that that can go from it, it's probably a full bisection switch and they probably do have a switch per rack and then have those switches connected to one another across all the yeah. racks and did, the you find a, cycle. did you find it surprising that they're doing ethernet i mean i, I would have thought they would have gone with something bigger infiniband <laughs> <laughs> they uh the it's an interesting choice. Um, there are really fast, e I mean, so they're doing their own protocol over ethernet. So ethernet's a layer two protocol. It's pretty mm -hmm. low overhead. It's really universal. It's really easy to get silicon that does that. If you wanna use InfiniBand, which is Mellanox's, uh, InfiniBand is the networking technology, which is more widely used in clusters. Like and 10 hyperscale gig or 25 networks. gig or 100 gig, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's proprietary, right? Yeah. Oh, so okay. uh, it could be that Tesla wanted to do their own silicon and they wanted to develop their own protocol. And if you use Mellanox, you don't get that choice, right? Okay, that makes so sense. So that would be, I haven't thought a lot about it, but I'll, just off the top of my head, that's what occurs to me. Could Tesla develop their own? <laughs> their so own to buy, like the, the, the sort of like that that ethernet replacement that they will, where they won't have to deal with the royalties of what was that? The gigaband? What was it called? James? Infiniband. Infiniband. What is there a chance that they could develop their own technology that would allow them to go, you know, orders of magnitude faster through, I guess, through the, through the channels than ethernet would allow them to do. Like how, uh, how well, certainly, would that be? you know, anything is possible, it, but I, that that's actually, I used to design those kinds of interfaces and I can tell you okay. it, it's not uh, for the faint of heart. <laughs> it, it's not also Tesla is unlikely to need enough interfaces to be able to compete that when you talk about like, um, you know, the, the transceivers and cables and the, the die that are used uh, for these network uh, switches uh, or for these network interfaces, they're, they're made in quite large volumes and, uh, and they tend to be pretty economical because you can, you can just get the raw die and, and kind of, and, and go with that. So uh, my guess is that uh, Tesla doesn't want to spend time uh, on that problem unless they, they think they're going to get their money's worth. And in this case, it was more cost effective for them to just, you know, use whatever width and speed of, of ethernet that they could get off the shelf and then layer their own protocol on top of ethernet and go with that. Got it. So we started with hardware design that breaks through traditional integration boundaries in service of a vision of a single giant accelerator. We've seen how the compiler and ingest layers build on top of that hardware. So after proving our performance on these complex real world networks, we knew what our first large scale deployment would target, our high arithmetic intensity auto labeling networks. Today that occupies 4,000 GPUs over 72 GPU racks. 
with our dense compute and our high performance, we expect to provide the same throughput with just four dojo candidates. And these four dojo cabinets will be part of our first exapod that we plan to build by quarter one of 2023. This will more than double Tesla's out of living capacity. The first exapod is part of a total of seven exapods that we plan to build in Palo Alto right here across the wall. And we have a display cabinet from one of these exapods for everyone to look at. Six tiles densely packed on a tray, 54 petaflops of compute, 640 gigabytes of high bandwidth memory with power and host defeated. A lot of compute. And we're building out new versions of all our cluster components and constantly improving our software to hit new limits of scale. We believe that we can get another 10x improvement with our next generation hardware. Yeah, so it looks like the NIC is separate. I paused this. So they're building a D2 tile. This is the interface processor that sits uh, in this row right underneath, the, right underneath the tiles. And then it looks like this DNIC is probably going in the host. And to realize our ambition, so DNIC would be Dojo Network Interface card. card yeah. Just goals, we need the best software and hardware engineers. So please come talk to us or visit tesla.com slash AI. Thank you. Hey. It all makes sense now. <laughs> Does it? Anyway, thanks for your help with all this stuff and the questions. And yeah. I actually have, I have one. Uh, so they showed uh, the thing where, um, they were going to have seven, seven cap, no, sorry, seven exo, exopods, exopods, build, yeah. exopods. And they showed, uh, what was it? Four cabinets would be equivalent to 78 GPUs or something. 72 what was GPU that? racks. Racks. 78 yeah. so racks. Okay. That's 72 yeah. racks. So those, those boxes are probably, uh, there's probably six, six boxes per rack. Six Maybe that like three X so, efficiency improvement, essentially roughly. Right. I'm just doing a uh, math here. It's, yeah. <laughs> Something like that, right? Something. So uh, 72 rack, that. there's probably like 50 GPUs, so 72. So 72 racks is probably like 4,000 GPUs, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So what, what I'm trying to get my head wrapped around is, okay, so they said in by, by Q1 of 2023, they're going to have double the compute power for auto labeling, right? Two and a half. So yeah. two and a half. Yeah, right. so the, it takes um, it takes um, forty about a third. Of, so a dojo, uh, a, an exapod is three thousand die. So yeah. um, so they take it take about a thousand die, gets them what they're getting out of um, four thousand uh, GPUs, and then yeah. and they're going to have three thousand die. So they'll have you know so that when they get the first exapod done, if they only used it for auto labeling it would be um, 3x the capacity of their 72 racks of GP. So a rack is, you know, it's about the size of a small refrigerator and it's a stack of yep. computers. A rack is a 19 inch wide standard, or actually they, they might be wider than that for these things, but it's a 19 inch wide sort of uh, frame that you bolt computers into and they're used in data Got centers it. as a standard organization for these things. So based on that, uh, so based on that, and the rate of improvement that they think they're going to have, would it be realistic to say that by the end of next year they could be at say 10x the capability to compute versus where they are today? Just kind of thinking through that, a build out that they're going through, is that a correct? Well, way so of if they about it? if they get if they have seven exapods, they'll have what 20 times the capacity of their current 4,000 cluster just for the for if you're just talking about auto labeling so they, they talked about auto labeling and occupancy which together make up 50 percent of their of the demand yeah. on their current cluster um although they probably the auto labeler runs in one cluster that's four thousand, and then the occupancy network training that's going to be you know part of the ten thousand uh gpu cluster which is which is separate but collectively they they make up about 50 percent of tesla's total um uh cluster usage right now. So yeah, I, I mean, it would be, it'd be 20 times 4k GPUs or like 80,000 GPUs worth of compute. Yeah. Got okay. it. Okay. So that helps me a lot in sort of framing it from the perspective of, okay, so the amount of data that they have coming in is going to, you know, this is why they're building this thing because they have a gigantic amount of data coming through and they need a, a way of computing it at a reasonable cost as quickly as humanly possible. And so yeah. they're like, we're, we're just going to develop our own stuff. Right. Um, okay. Got it. So that helps me a lot 
in conceptualizing what does that mean in reference to how many, how much data they're going to get from the cars in the coming quarters and years versus the ramp of the compute that they're on, like that they have to ramp this hardware extremely fast to be able to absorb all the data they're going to get in the next one to two years from full self driving. Well, yeah, right. well, go ahead. Well, actually, I'll interject. So it's yeah, part yeah. of it is the data in, increasing, but another part of it is how it's used, and I think what the neural nets are going to do with the data. So as there's more models and the neural nets grow, Tesla's going to be able to branch into more things like more 3D kind of modeling. Mm. They're going to start start to move from, I think, um, from kind of the coarse volumetric kind of rendering they're doing into finer, finer detail. Um, all of that's going to take more and more compute power, training power. And so there's a lot of stuff Tesla could do, you know, as for the next many years, you know, to, um, yeah, especially with, you know, the amount of video and the amount of, uh, you know, 3D rendering they need for like high fidelity accuracy um, as these neural nets improve. Yeah. Dave, yeah, so, I mean, you... they're, they get better performance and they get better cost performance uh, because they're, they're basically claiming which is kind of hard to believe, but really awesome if it's true, that they're getting a 6x cost improvement over their A100 cluster, right? Um, so that's one thing is like, if you, you know, if you want to, if you got to spend, you know, 80,000 GPUs is a lot of money. It's like, I don't know, a billion dollars worth of a GPU cluster, right? And you'd way rather spend a billion dollars than $6 billion. Like that 6x, you know, cost improvement is a really big deal. But the other thing is that, if your if your teams are being limited, like you know how fast they can get results when they do an experiment is being limited by how much it costs to run it. Like you you know, essentially you can't run as big a computer as you want to go as fast. And the performance is the other thing. You know, with the they should be able to scale better, which means it'll be much more cost effective for the team to say you know, this job that we've been running and we've been running it, you know, once, once a week and it takes three days, we really want it to happen in 12 hours because we want to speed our process up. Well, today, if you want to run that thing five or six X faster, you're going to need a 10 X or 15 X bigger, you know, cluster, or you're going to need to take 10 or 15 uh, times as much of your cluster capacity and devote it to that. And with, with Dojo going up, will be, it'll be like, it'll be much closer to, you know, if you need, if you want to run three times as fast, you're just taking three times as much complete uh, cluster resources. Sure. So it's, it's more costly, but yeah, it'll, it'll allow them to do, to ingest more data, to do more auto labeling, to run more experiments, to build bigger networks. I mean, the, a big part of the auto labeler right now is this big neural network that they use that pre labels all the data that he, before humans go through and they look at it. And you want that, you want to run a really big network, right? It's going to give you better results, but the bigger it, it gets, I mean, the, the cost of training, it kind of goes as a square of the size of the network. Like if you make twice as big a network, typically you need at least twice as much data to feed it, which is four times as much training resources to do it. So it's expensive to go bigger on you. And, and you, and you might just be getting incremental improvements in efficiency in accuracy. That is, you know, you might have like a, a 0.5% or a 1% error rate. And like you, you know, you got to go to twice the network to get down to like 0.7% or something. So it becomes really cost ineffective to go above a certain threshold. And if you can bring that cost down, you can push those numbers out and do better. Do, do we know how they stage everything? Do we know oh, how they do? Show. <laughs> yeah, that was weird. Yeah, so so you you essentially have all this data coming back to home, right? Well, mm -hmm. where's all that being staged before it actually makes its way into you know the, the the labeler to go through everything, or how's it scrubbed, or is it retained? I mean, like we never really talk about that part, right? Mm -hmm. Everything's coming in, but where does it sit until it's ready to be used? I think they said they have a thirty petabyte um cluster that they use oh, that's it. for storing intermediate results um so you know they bring they did all they did say like in the fsd part of this they talk more about about uh you know the size of of the thing and how fast they bring in new clips and that you know they've got a 30 petabyte storage and they bring they're bringing lots of stuff in and they throw old stuff away at a pretty yeah. so i'm guessing that they're like storage capacity limited but it's also the case that 
you know, as you get more data in and you understand the problem better, you can determine that, you know, these training examples aren't helping us as much as these are. So we get rid of those and we put these in instead. Um, yeah. Yeah. And going back to what Dave was saying earlier about the performance, as far as like the, the 3d rendering, just becoming better and better. So like right now they show us like those voxels and, you know, rather large dimensions compared to everything else around it. Right. If you look mm -hmm. at it. So I think, is this kind of what you're saying, Dave, that with the, you know, with the ability of what Doge is going to do, we can make those voxels even smaller and smaller, which would essentially give us a better, more detailed picture around of what the occupancy network's really seen. Yeah. I mean, I'll let James follow up on this, but yeah, I, I, from my, you know, limited knowledge, it just seems like there's huge progressions being made in the AI field regarding in computer vision, regarding kind of the, not just these occupancy networks, but these neural radiant fields, nerves, where you're able to mm -hmm. take video images and actually do high fidelity, accurate 3D rendering from that. And to me, um, what Tesla is showing right now with their occupancy maps and their course rendering of volume, it's it's like kind of a preview of where Tesla needs to head um, because from what I understand, the volumetric kind of map, rendering occupancy map, they're using that, um, but it's too coarse for, for fine planning. They need to, that gives them a, a guide where they hone in on certain areas to get more specific information. Um, but that's kind of a limitation of a lot of things right now. Um, but one of the limitations, just kind of the state of art in terms of neural nets, and nerfs is still like, it's relatively a new field um, or it's progressing rapidly every year. And so um, Tesla seems to be very interested in this kind of area. They know where they need to head. Um, so it just seems logical to me that, um, and they're already like doing a lot with, you know, simulation, but it seems logical next steps where um, these neural nets will, will grow in size and in capacity, but you'll be able to take video and output not just voxels um, and occupancy map, but eventually you'll be able to output high fidelity 3D environments, you know, from video. Um, but that's going to take a lot of, you know, advancement in the field, but a lot of compute uh, and training and data. Um, and so Tesla, I think that's one of the reasons why they're building uh, Dojo is because they know this isn't just a one or two year thing, you know, FSD. Yeah. Like this, th this is going to be like every year they're going to need a lot more compute, a lot more problems to solve. Um, and it's going to get better and better and better. They think they could, you know, release the FSC functionality, right. Um, by the end of the year, at least in wide release or beta, but this to get the levels of magnitude accuracy above, you know, human driving, there's going to need a lot of advancements, but Dojo is kind of, I think that long-term play, um, banking on the advancements in AI and they want to be at the forefront, you know, of utilizing that. James, you have any thoughts? Um, yeah. Well, actually, it's, before you yeah, go, I think uh, far, had, actually, uh, hold on one second. As far as that, I know you need to uh, leave at exactly six. I got right? like so five or 10 more. I got like five okay. or 10 more. Right, whenever yeah. you need to leave, just, just go ahead, you know, we'll and just say bye and then we'll let yeah, yeah. you out. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Go ahead, James. Appreciate that. Um, I think if, if Tesla had a hundred times the compute, they could use it all right now. Mm -hmm. And wow. the limiter is just like, it, you know, it's, it's kind of like buying a new desktop computer, right? You, uh, you know, they have a half-life, you buy one in three years, there's a better one. So, uh, it's, you know, it's a, it, it's a, it, it, it goes bad. So there's, there's always this, you know, the, the cost of, of acquiring tons of stuff, which is going to be obsolete in three years is, is pretty uh, painful. So in the, in a sense, the compute thing is a, it's a cost limitation. I mean, they've got lots of cash, but they don't want to throw it away on stuff that's, that's not going to be useful in three years. So, um, so I think, it, you know, cost is a big, is a big deal. And then the scaling thing is the other thing that right now, uh, if you want to go, if you want to train really big networks, like big clusters actually aren't very good at it. Cause that, that whole thing that where the curve goes over, at some point, you don't get the linear scaling. So the, the bigger thing you want to train, the farther out on that, you know, it, the more it costs you per unit of the size of the neural network that, that you're working with. And Dojo is an attempt to solve both those problems. It's like, let us, let's get control of our own costs as far as the, 
as far as the compute interface goes. And let's come up with something that's going to scale better so that we can go to these bigger neural networks without the penalty that we have right now with the GPU cluster. Yeah. I think um, also one of the, I don't think it's necessarily like a intention or a top priority for Tesla, but one of the like results of focusing on Dojo over time could be Tesla gets less, is less susceptible to comp competition in the FSD field because they're using kind of from first principles, this next generation platform of compute training, where if they were to rely just on NVIDIA GPU clusters and go with that route, and there was a new company entering the field with lots of resources who could think from first principles and redo basically a next generation platform who could achieve great, you know, cost efficiencies over Tesla, let's say, then they're, you know, I'm not saying that it's not the end of the world, but I mean, Tesla can pivot at that time, but it's just an interesting thing to think about where, you know, I don't think again, it's a priority, top priority or it's intentional per se, but as a result, I think Tesla's competitive position over the next five or 10 years actually strengthens because, you know, the training, the compute power is is in their hands. They're taking control, you know, of that destiny, um, with and relying less on others, you know, um, to to for that. So it's it's an interesting, um, yeah, consequence I of mean, all this. The thing that goes through my mind is like the usually the bigger and more mature a company gets, the more and more they look to outsource and partner with third parties to make their operation as lean as humanly possible. Tesla's like, screw that. We're gonna learn about oscillating chips. Like, what the hell is that? You know, like it like the amount of expertise that has to go into something like that and the amount of talent you have to recruit. I mean, that's why they're hosting this thing. It's like they, they get two benefits. They get the benefit that they're doing it versus everyone else who's afraid to do it and they are willing to outsource for someone else to solve that problem. But then as they get bigger, they do it even more and more. Like that's that's what I'm getting out of this. So they get a 2x, you know, they, they get a, what is that? A 4x, I guess, improvement on on just getting better over time, which is that acceleration of separation versus versus peers. It's like, it's it's so weird. It's so weird to this day, just how unafraid they are to delve into, to, I mean, to a layman to myself, it's like, it's so beyond above my head and James and, and this panel has helped me understand it so much, so much more better, but it's in reinforcement to that thought process is we don't care how big we get, we're still going to solve our own problems. It doesn't matter how difficult it is. It's important to, for the mission. It's, it's yeah. insane. Yeah. I yeah. think, um, yeah, carrying on those thoughts, it's, yeah. um, yeah, it's, it's interesting, um, that, um, Pete Banning, going back to his comments, Tesla isn't just a car company. You know, they're a hardcore tech company, right? Trying to solve, like, like improve the human condition, push forward, right? Uh, massive solutions. And yeah, Dojo is one of those things where um, it would be really foolish to to attempt it if you aren't a hardcore tech company. You know, this is like exactly. really crazy stuff. Um, but Tesla's doing it. What the result is, is not only do you, deal with FSD, but you deal with what's after FSD, which is the Optimus humanoid robot. Like this is all part of the, the engine. This is all part of the, the brains, what it takes to build the brains, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so yeah, it's like, yeah, it's, it just, uh, I think exemplifies the point, you know, Tesla is definitely a hardcore tech company, um, pushing the envelope. And this is just, you know, one example. And it's not the only thing they're doing either. You know, it's like they've got a right. lot of stuff on their plate. Um, yeah, fun stuff. You can kind of think of this as like, you know, them getting into lithium mining, right? Because, you know, they want there to be more lithium and it's not coming, it's not coming up. Compute is a raw material that they need and the world isn't producing enough of it. It's not producing the right kind. So they're they're going to do it themselves. And I often wonder how much of this falls at, you know, one of the experiences they had with Panasonic was like, we'll buy the batteries, make more, make more. And yet Panasonic only moves or only could move. Like, I don't know exactly what the dynamic was, but to some extent they're getting starved because they have this, you know, they're pushing as hard as they can. They're doing everything they can to demonstrate that demand is there. And yet their partner isn't able to keep up with their needs. And, you know, so you bring it inside and you do it yourself because, you know, it's a rate limiter. It's critical to our ability to scale the way that we want to. And if other people don't believe in it the way we do, 
we'll pay for it, we'll put the time in, we'll learn the problem and we'll solve that bottleneck. And compute is a super important bottleneck going forward for all this neural network stuff. Like you wanna be big in AI, you're gonna need a lot of compute. And the more you have, the more, the more power accrues to you in that space. You wanna control your own destiny, control your own compute. Yeah, I think also if the Tesla really can achieve, let's say six X, whatever cost efficiencies and, um, it it gives this like extra encouragement to use it to use the compute because you're like you know cheapest in in class in terms of compute you've got you know just mat you're building just massive amounts of compute power just all these exapods let's say left and right and so whereas before you're a little maybe cautious or you know you can only go at a certain pace but the cheaper your compute is you can be more aggressive in building out more of that compute right? Um, power and platform, which can in turn speed up how fast you push the envelope, test out new things, you know, roll out new things. So it can be definitely an accelerator, I think, you know, over time. Yeah. It almost seems like to, to parallel what Elon always says that the factory is the real product for the auto side. It seems like Dojo is the real product for the AI side almost. I would say one of the product, like I, I think the AI side requires multiple products in a, in a multiple factories in a sense, because you've got, you know, the 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 data the data side, the engine, you know, the, the mm -hmm. getting all that the data. You got the the infrastructure. I guess Dojo, the training, the compute is one part of the factory, and then you've got kind of like the whole stack of you know all the software from QA to tooling to, to all this, you know. Put together so yeah i would say that the whole thing is you yeah. know the factory in a sense um um yeah crazy uh gentlemen i do have to jump out uh but okay. i thank you very much dave for hosting this conversation i, I like i want to ask so many questions but I, yeah I, yeah unfortunately it was i gotta go but i thank you all so much thank you james for taking the time man i can't believe this is like available for all of us to view but thank you thank you nick and uh yeah amazing uh i learned a lot today and it finally like so I, from, from my, from a layman's perspective, I, I know that Tesla and Elon and the team just coming out and showing this to the world and, you know, saying, Hey, this is exactly what we're working on already gave me a, a vote of confidence that said they're barking up the right tree, but actually understanding the mechanics behind what they're solving, uh, takes my ability to sort of put this within my context of what Tesla could mean in the next five to 10 years in, in a much clearer picture. So thank you, James, for answering all those questions. Man. Thanks we for participating, Parzan. Yeah, right. of course. Yeah. Parzan, yeah. Take all care, right, man. All right. Bye -bye. Yeah, I think another interesting angle is if you are in Tesla's position and you're really serious about not just FSD, but further applications of AI, um, and you had massive data needs, massive compute needs, this is, it makes sense, you know, that, that you would pursue this type of, you know, effort. It just requires a lot of courage and boldness from the CEO and from management at top to, to allocate, you know, a limited, you have a, a finite amount of focus, right, um, that you could do as a company, but to really allocate this, it just means, in my opinion, it means that Elon and his team are, are really seeing things clearly. Like they really... Like this AI thing isn't just like, you know, a fad for them or something. This they're seeing it as the future of the company. And it makes complete sense for them to invest, you know, a lot into building, you know, the compute platform of the future. Yeah. Yeah. It it's very strange to me that 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 people can see this stuff and still think like who's who out there is still thinking that Tesla is like a car company and that they need to be judged that way. I like I feel like to the extent that there are people who are still, you know, evaluating Tesla inside that framework, like how much must you not be paying attention in order to, it's just, it, it boggles the mind that to think that there are still people putting Tesla in that box. Yeah, definitely. Um, hey, Nicholas, did you have any uh, kind of final questions? Um, um not right this second. I probably okay. will in about 10 minutes. But God, man, I finally get on with James and Dave. And I <laughs> I have all these other questions I end up writing down. But no, I, I appreciate the time. I appreciate the invite. Uh, mm -hmm. Learned so much, seeing things a lot clearer. It's funny. The other day I was sitting there telling someone, yeah, I think I understood that 10 to 15% you know, of what I saw. Mm -hmm. I might be at 17% now. <laughs> <laughs> I know. You know? Yeah, so, yeah. 
but awesome. I appreciate the invite and, uh, yeah, it's great to meet both of you, uh, finally. <laughs> Cool, cool. Yeah, um, yeah, I'll link to uh, Nicholas's um, YouTube channel, Investing Against the Grain, in the video description. All right, guys. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to explain. I've got a secret, um, a secret, a, a surprise for those listening. Uh, James and I, we recorded actually an episode a couple days ago in person at my house on Dojo. And it was going through um, the first half of the slides on Dojo on the hardware. And so we spent like almost an hour and a half going through the slides. And a lot of that content, some of it overlapped, but actually a lot of it didn't really overlap. It was a more detailed explanation on, on some of the context, why Tesla is doing what they're doing, some of the software stack um, approaches they're doing, and a lot of really interesting stuff. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually stitch that video onto this video. So it's gonna be a mega episode uh, on Dojo. <laughs> Close to four hours. Maybe you could link it as a separate video. Because people get on, come on this thing and they see a five-hour video. They're not even going to start. It's going to be longer than AI day. It's, yeah, um, that's it's, right. It's all, we're already pushing AI day. Yeah, right. yeah. No, it, actually, it will be longer than AI day, <laughs> this video, just on Dojo. But um, yeah. yeah, actually, I, I, I kind of, um, there's something kind of, there's a pro and con of it. There'll be less people initially who watch it. But mm -hmm. when it's pulled together in one video, actually... Um, YouTube will reward the long watch time by those who watch it. So over mm -hmm. time, it'll actually get more uh, views, I think. That's okay. my yeah uh, experience. So anyways, we'll stitch it together. This will be a mega dojo episode. Um, <laughs> it's been fun. Um, and then um, tomorrow, we've got another uh, live uh, or another watch party on the FSD portion of Tesla mm -hmm. AI Day, which actually is the bigger portion, this Dojo section was actually a short, yeah. a much we might shorter have to section. Break that one into two pieces because I, I don't, I can't do yeah. five hours of this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, after about two hours, like it's like I get kind yeah. of um, yeah, in and out. Um, anyways, um, yeah, we'll go ahead and uh, whether it's one part or two parts, we'll see. But anyways, want to thank um, yeah, James and uh, yeah, Nicholas Farzad and everyone who's watching. Appreciate your time, and um, yeah, it's amazing that. This stuff is happening and it's amazing that we can actually talk about it and share and you know comment and um yeah everyone who wants to in the world can can chip in and watch it as well all right so signing out um we'll see you guys last words uh nicholas yeah, yeah. thanks for participating i appreciate you coming on yeah, yeah absolutely and uh and dave thanks for setting this up no problem okay all right see you guys Cheers, everybody I'm going to dive into the slides that Tesla presented on their Dojo training supercomputer where it's at right now. And we're going to have, yeah, I'm going to shoot some questions and really try to get down where we can actually understand a lot of the stuff that Tesla presented. So James, hey, let's, let's do it again. Um, so one of the things I loved most about the Dojo presentation was Pete Bannon coming out and giving his little reduction. And it's a little unfortunate, like he didn't, he didn't have any slides. So all I've got is a slide of Pete talking up in front of the audience and whatnot, yeah. but he, I actually, he said two I, things that were kind of interesting. I actually got a transcript of his, his stuff so that I could refer back to it. And uh, so he had one thing that I thought was sort of interesting, which, which it, he, it kind of distills the whole essence of, of, uh, you know, what AI day has and, you know, is showing for a certain respect with Tesla. He says, uh, I'm frequently asked why a car company is building a supercomputer for training, and this question fundamentally misunderstands the nature of Tesla. At its heart, Tesla is a hardcore technology company. All across the company, people are working hard in science and engineering to advance the fundamental understanding and methods that we have available to build cars, energy solutions, and robots, and anything else, so we can do more to improve the human condition around the world. It's super exciting thing to be a part of, and it's a privilege to run a small piece of the semiconductor group. You know, which is that's so sort of a great element of like everything that you get out of AI day is like, you know, if you think we're hanging tires on chassis, <laughs> that's our core value add. Uh -huh. You're like missing a lot of stuff. Yeah. But then the other thing I really enjoyed was his, he had a great summary about the dojo. Why they uh, how they ended up with this approach. When we got started, the goal was to provide a substantial improvement to the training latency for the for our autopilot team. Some of the largest neural networks they train today run for over a month, which inhibits their ability to rapidly explore 
alternatives and evaluate them. So, you know, a 30x speed up would be really nice if we could provide it at a cost competitive and energy competitive way. To do that, we wanted to build a chip with a lot of arithmetic units that could that we could utilize at a very high efficiency. And we spend a lot of time studying whether we could do that using DRAM, various packaging ideas, all of which failed. And in the end, it felt like an unnatural act, though it felt like an unnatural act. We decided to reject DRAM as a primary storage medium for the system and instead focus on SRAM embedded in the chip. So I was taking a pause at that. Mm -hmm. That's, so, so DRAM, you know, every, uh, DRAM is like the main memory that you get in a laptop. It's, uh, I mean, you have a hard drive, right? Or and then we have SSDs that store stuff on flash. And they're really big, but they're pretty slow. And then you have DRAM, which stores most of the active working stuff that like a CPU has is stored in DRAM. And on a CPU, you have cache memory, uh, various stages of cache, and then you have registers inside the CPU. Well, going to the DRAM takes 100 or 1000 times longer than like operating off of the registers inside, uh, inside uh, the CPU chip itself because stuff that interacts on the chip can move really, really fast and it has very low energy requirement because the transistors on the chip itself are really small. But as soon as you have to exit the chip and you have to go to the DRAM, now it takes a long time and it takes a ton of energy. So on CPUs, you do we do this thing called caching, which is um, we don't ask the guy who writes a program to anticipate what he's going to need in a little while and fetch it, right, so that it's on the computer, by, so it's on the CPU chip by the time he needs it. Instead, we use, there's hardware on the CPU that figures out that basically when you fetch something, it fetches all the other stuff that's around it in case you might need that at the same, next, right? And usually you do. Most It turns out most computer programs do that. They also, there's algorithms built into the hardware that try to guess what you're going to need and fetch it. So that, you know, 90% or 99% of the time that you're doing stuff, you're operating off of SRAM. Um, SRAM, you can put it on the chip, but you can't put nearly as much of it on. So the trade-off is, you know, it's super fast, takes very little energy, but it's much smaller than what you can put in DRAM, right? And computer models are big, and it's hard to write things so they don't take very much memory. So computers use DRAM. We just use DRAM and everything. Almost all the neural networks out there today, like they store most of what they're working with in DRAM, and then they come up with various different ways of fetching it onto the chip so that they can work on it. And Tesla with Dojo, they decided early on, like they looked at doing, so another way of trying to do this is, is if you could somehow find a way to integrate the DRAM with what you want, then you'd get the DRAM and you'd also get your stuff. And Pete basically said, yeah, we looked at that. And we just couldn't figure out how to do it well. We tried all these different ways of packaging stuff, and it just didn't work. So, I mean, is it basically SRAM is memory on the chip? Yeah, sure. Basically. You can think of it that way. Okay. Static SRAM means static RAM, okay. which is, uh, you know, it, it typically has four or six transistors for each bit of information that it stores. And they, it stores that information in sort of this dynamic uh, balance between the state of two transistors. So it uses power continuously while it's stored. DRAM, the way modern DRAM is, is it's, there's a tiny little capacitor for each bit. And when you write something to the to memory, you're writing, you're putting charge on a bunch of little capacitors. And then it slowly fades away, right? So before it fades away, you have to read it and write it again. You have to read it to check the value and then re you have to refresh it, right? So modern DRAM chips, they refresh themselves. And the great thing about DRAM is you can fetch the information, you know, it's still on silicon. It still runs at a pretty high rate. Um, you can read it relatively quickly on the chip. The, ma the main reason that DRAM is slow is because it's on a different chip than the CPU. So, you know, the, tran the transistors on these, uh, on these things, they're, they're, like, they're measured in nan nanometers, like they're tens of nanometers in size. But then I have a wire that connects from my chip to the, like the printed circuit board, and it's like a million nanometers wide, <laughs> you know, like, well, it's, that's probably not quite right. It's, you know, thousands of nanometers wide. So like you've got this tiny little transistor and then you've got this wire that to the transistor is the size of a cable and it just won't work. So on a chip, what you have to do is that little transistor drives a bigger one and that drives a bigger one and that drives a bigger one, right? And then that one's finally big enough to drive this a, a bond wire, which is a thousandth of an inch 
you know, mm-hmm. I mean, it seems tiny to us, but to that little transistor, it's huge. So you got to go through all these stages and then now you got to run across this huge, you know, from the trans, from a chip transistor standpoint, this thing, the size of like a, a freeway, <laughs> you know, and mm-hmm. you're treating it as a wire. And then that goes to your DRAM. And then you got to do all that in reverse to get back on the DRAM because it's a separate chip. Mm-hmm. Like that's, um, going off chip is really expensive. Yeah. And DRAM is made in a fundamentally different semiconductor process than these, than these, uh, uh, than these, you know, than the semiconductor process, which is used for like CPUs and GPUs and the D1 chip. So, you know, so B basically said, you know, we tried to figure out how to get these two pieces of silicon together so that, you know, we could try to do the, do the processing and we just couldn't figure out how to do it. It's, it's a problem because you have all these orders of magnitude size difference between things that you find yourself having to go up this hierarchy of size and then go back down it every time you go from one chip to another. And it's just, it means that going off chip is like a hundred or a thousand times more expensive or a hundred and a thousand times slower than just doing stuff on chip. It's like just a huge hit. You have to do it. If you can't fit everything you want on your chip, you got no choice but to go off. But you try to be very judicious about how you do it. And uh, and Tesla basically said, we just reject that. Mm-hmm. We're going to put it all in SRAM on the chip. And so what that means, essentially, is that you're going to have to uh, is you're going to have to accept some pretty uh, difficult trade offs uh, and design around that with the way that you do your software and your algorithms and that kind of stuff. And for the most part, uh, you know, like that just kind of isn't done today, right? There, there aren't big systems that get built that way for the most part that actually need a lot of data. Uh, it requires you to be clever about all kinds of things that we kind of take for granted with, with regular computers. So I, it, like it's notable because it explains mm-hmm. that, yeah, we didn't back into this design with some other things. We looked at the fundamental you know, thing like DRAM, SRAM, <laughs> and we made this key decision early on and then, and, and it manifested in this architecture that we've got. Um, he continues. Uh, SRAM provides, unfortunately, a modest amount of capacity, but extremely high bandwidth and very low latency that enables us to achieve high utilization with your arithmetic units. That particular choice led to a whole bunch of other choices. For example, if you want to have virtual memory, you need page tables that take up a lot of space, and we don't have space, so no virtual memory. We also don't have interrupts. Anyway, he goes through other consequences of this. Uh, So frequently, you know, you hear these chips uh, and systems are described in terms of like, what's the peak number of operations that you could get out of them, right? Mm -hmm. Because that's an easy number to calculate. Like, you know, if I had the perfect problem, how fast could it run? Like, Mm -hmm. what's the top speed of my car under ideal circumstances, right? But the reality is you might have the sports car that can go 200 miles an hour, but you got a, you got a city street that you can only go 30 miles an hour on. Most problems are like that. So when I looked at, I went and looked at, uh, not the ideal benchmark, but public Mm -hmm. benchmarks that are, uh, for the, at A100 GPU, which is uh, up until recently NVIDIA's top of the line GPU. There's plenty of benchmarks for it. And I looked at like, you know, what fraction of top speed do they actually get to run at? So like, you know, if they're if the top speed of the GPU is like 100, how fast is it driving on average when it's running one of these algorithms? And it's, it's kind of shockingly terrible. Um, if you're just doing a problem on one GPU card, you get maybe 20 miles an hour out of your 100 mile an hour top speed, like 20%. And if you have a box full of GPUs, so they have to talk off of one card to another card, because that's another you know layer you have to get through, then it's maybe 10%. Mm-hmm. So now you know, you, you know, you've got all these cars and they're all driving together, but now they can only drive 10 miles an hour to cover that thing. And then once you get to the rack level where you gotta go from one box to the box, now it's five miles an hour, right? Mm-hmm. And all of this has to do with like getting farther away from the chip, not being able to run at what your max rate is called the, you know, operational efficiency of the systems gets bad. And uh, now uh, what, imagine what you could get if you, if, if you're, if you were able to go 80 miles an hour instead of five miles an hour or 90 miles an hour instead of five, like that's a huge multiplier. You could have the same chip, right? The same number of transistors, same cost, same power budget, not quite the same, but similar power budget. 
And, and yet all of a sudden you're getting like 10 times more utilization or five times more utilization. Like that's a, if you can pull it off, like that's a great way to make your computer faster, Mm -hmm. right? At a good price. So, and that is essentially Tesla's ambition, right? They're going, they're restructuring the problems that they're doing on Dojo and they're redefining the way that they do this because they're trying to get high utilization of the arithmetic units. The arithmetic units are the things that give you your tops, your trillion operation per second. That's the thing. The number of arithmetic units times the clock rate of the thing, that's your top speed. So there's like, you know, they're going to build a super high top speed. And if you look at like the A100 and you look at the D1, the top speed is kind of the same. They're both like 100 mile an hour cars, right? But the ambition that Tesla's looking for is let's find a way to make the rest of the set up the rest of the system so that our 100 mile an hour chip gets to go 90 miles an hour on average when we do a problem. Mm -hmm. Because that A100 when I put it in a rack and I make a really big computer, it can only go five miles an hour. So that becomes a huge advantage. So how do we do that? Yeah. How do we make everything else so that it can keep the system? And so that's a fundamental design decision. It's a thing you decide you're going to do on day one because everything else you do in the system has to support that decision. And so Steve, um, Pete, <laughs> keep calling him Steve. Pete is, uh, he's very eloquently sort of distilled down that essential A, B, C of the logic that leads. And, and once you, once you look at it that way, you can kind of see how all the other um, architectural elements of Dojo fall out of yeah. that decision. <clears throat> um, yeah, it's definitely interesting. Um, so a few things, I think for most people who listen, they're like Pete Bannon, who, but there's context. He is very respected mm-hmm. in the chip yeah. field. He's a, a big deal. A legendary chip designer who's been with Tesla for a long time, but he's, you know, involved with Dojo. This gives a lot of legitimacy, more legitimacy to Dojo than mm-hmm. perhaps without him there. It's just, um, that's one thing. But it's also interesting. He's like, Tesla is a hardcore tech company because to do what Tesla's doing, the ambition of creating a, this, it's not just a, a chip. It's not just a tile or whatever. It's all of the other stuff surrounding yeah. the, to run that, you know, all the libraries and tooling, all this stuff that it's a huge effort that you have to be a hardcore tech company to, to even attempt to do yeah. this. You know what I'm saying? It's like something that um, is very, it's an interesting insight by Pete. That's um, it, it, yeah. arguably harder than rocket science. Actually. Yeah. <laughs> There's, it's got a lot of layers to it. Yeah. And even... You know, even once you've got the, ch- even once you have the system basically working, you've kind of only started because mm-hmm. there's this unbelievably sophisticated set of software that you need to map stuff onto the system efficiently, to keep it fed, to schedule jobs, to manage your system. Uh, and that they have to rewrite that from scratch because yeah. the architecture they're using is so different that there's almost nothing that they can just like adopt. They can just pick up off the shelf. And so, yeah, yeah, it's a colossal effort. Yeah. I mean, it does seem like, you know, and from me talking with you um, and, and researching, it seems like there's huge inefficiencies with running big neural nets mm-hmm. on current GPUs. And, yeah. and it just seems like this is, it bothers Tesla too, because I mean, if you look, out further long enough it can become an issue you know um where yeah it's like you're running this inefficient you know training computer that's just like costing a fortune but you know it could be done a lot better um and you know there's different things one that could save time it could save money but also it's a it could be a competitive um threat if you don't do it yourself you know if there's Mm -hmm. another let's say big hardcore tech company that does it and holds that tech to themselves. Um, but yeah, I think you just, I mean, even beyond that, it's rate limiting for you. Like mm-hmm. if this is a thing, like if you see your curve going this way, it's, you know, it's like the lithium for the batteries, right? Yeah. You can ignore it. But at some point you can look down the road and you can say, if we keep growing, the lithium's a problem and mm-hmm. we need to start working on that right now. So that this is like compute is a problem. Compute is like, it's like, you know, it's like lithium is for the cars, right? Yeah. For FSD and AI, the stuff that they want to do, they need the compute. And the people out there making it, they're not making enough. <laughs> so we got to have to make them, you know, somehow there needs to be more. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing how Tesla's still able to focus on like 
of all the things they're doing, they're mm-hmm. doing a ton of things. This requires an immense amount of energy and focus and dedication. Mm-hmm. Um, yet they're still able to, you know, to put what it takes to get this off the ground. Um, it's quite remarkable. I'm, I'm, I'm very impressed by what Tesla's doing so far at Dojo. Um, yeah. Um, let's get into some of the slides actually that they okay. should. Um, see if compute nodes. So this is, uh, each one of these little squares on this diagram, does it come through? Yes. Well, you can see, uh, okay. Yeah. So this is, uh, this is 120 tiles. Each tile is five by five. Each one of the squares is a D1 chip. That is a tile is five by five G1, uh, D1 chips. A D1 chip is around 300 teraops of operation. And so altogether these, you know, uh, 3000 D1 chips on this thing are giving you something like an exaflop, right? 3000 times 300 and something gets you roughly an exaflop of, so that is like, if you could keep them all busy, right? So in a GPU cluster, if I've got my 3000 chips, they have a 14,000, uh, GPU cluster, or they've got 14,000 GPUs mm-hmm. worth of cluster. I guess they've got three clusters. And they spend about 4K of it on, uh, according to stuff that was said here, they spend about uh, about 4,000 of those nodes just do auto labeling. And the other 10,000 are used for neural network training. So uh, they're already spending, mo- you know, they've got a, they, they have a 10,000 node machine, which is just during neural network. Now, but then, you know, if most of the things that they're training have this 5% efficiency, you know, they're instead of, you know, they really have 500 nodes instead of 10,000 nodes, right? That's 5% of 10,000. They're probably doing better than that. They can do more chip tailoring and that kind of stuff, but they might only be getting 10% of the top rated speed of all this kind of stuff. So that would be the equivalent of, uh, you know, say 1400 GPU nodes that were running uh, like full speed, the equivalent of 1400 nodes running flat out. So the dojo here, you've got, um, you know, 3000 chips and each of them, you know, at, at top speed is roughly similar to an A100 for the kinds of stuff, the kinds of math that Tesla does. But if they can get this to run, you know, so they've got 3,000 nodes, but if they can get to run at 80% efficiency, like if they can achieve that sort of efficiency target, and incidentally, 80%, that's just a number I'm picking. Mm-hmm. I've looked at, uh, you know, I did an analysis before they did this, before they did the FSD computer, trying to guess what the efficiency was on these different things. You can figure out a lot of it by looking at what Google does, because Google uses a similar sort of arithmetic unit in the TPUs. And on the early TPUs, they published benchmarks, and we could get some real numbers out of it. So based on those numbers, my guess is that they can beat 80% with the kind of architecture that they have. So that's that's a James number. I don't, aside from doing my own math and looking at papers that go into it, like that, that's what I've got. But I think that's a reasonable ambition. And if it's the ambition that they're going for, 80 or better, or if they get 80 or they get 90, well, 80% of 3,000 nodes is 2,400 nodes, right? So this dojo, you know, at, at 80% efficiency greatly exceeds the performance of their 10,000 node cluster that they have now. And this is one dojo machine, you know, they were talking about building seven. So if you can do that and you can hit the price points that they were talking about, which uh, occur in, in later slides, like it's a super compelling economic alternative to continuing to build bigger and bigger and bigger GPU clusters. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, GPU clusters are going to get better too. Yeah. So they're they've got to compete against that, but it's uh, it's interesting. Yeah. So the sea of compute node slide that we're looking at, when you uh, one of the things that they're you're kind of committing to when you don't have a lot of st- memory to store intermediate results in your system, like they're not using DRAM, is that it's it's hard to to uh, to use what's called data parallelism. So if uh, neural networks, when you're training them, you do the same thing over and over and over and over again. Like you have data, you run it through a neural network or part of a neural network, because frequently you can't load the whole thing on your computer at one time. So you run data through part of the neural network, and then you load the other part, you save those intermediate results, and you load the other part of the neural network, and you load those results. Uh, Then you run them through, and you might do this in multiple stages. So 
because you have to swap out because the whole neural network doesn't fit in the thing at one time and you have to swap pieces of it. Well, you'd like to swap it as uh, infrequently as possible because that's just overhead to what you're doing. Like you're not doing while you're swapping the, the neural network in memory, you're not doing useful computation. So one way to approach this is what we call data parallelism. And what you, and what you do, do in that case is you say, uh, you load the first part of the neural network and you run a hundred or a thousand samples through it and you save the intermediate results. And then you load the second part and you run a hundred or a thousand. Because once you've got it loaded, you can run a lot of stuff through it pretty quickly. So that's called batching where you, t you basically, instead of just running one signal through, you run a whole bunch, save the intermediate results, load the next part and do that. So you're kind of, you know, you're batching chunks through. So that data level parallelism is really popular uh, on GPU uh, accelerators because it's a good match for what they're doing. You don't like you can't fit the whole neural network in the GPU at the same time. So you uh, and but they have lots of G uh, they have lots of DRAM. So you you know you process a bunch of intermediate stuff, save it in DRAM, load the next uh, chunk of the neural network, process the next part, and so on, and you iterate through those quickly. So the ambition with the with uh, dojo is to do it a different way. It's to put the whole thing in memory. You load the whole neural network. Uh, and then you you basically, you know, when you're training, you always train lots of samples anyway. So it's not the case that you're ever only going to do one. It's, you know, I'm going to train a million samples. And do I do it in blocks of 100? Do I do it in blocks of one? In this case, you like do it in a block of a million. You can because you load the whole neural network in there. You run all a million samples through. Right. You do. You don't like do forward passes on all mil million. You do forward passes on some number, and then you update the weights in the neural network with a back backward pass, and then you do another batch. That's a separate kind of batching, it, which is separate from the data level parallelism. So that approach maps onto Dojo's fabric because Dojo doesn't have a lot of memory for storing those intermediate results. So if you pass something through and it goes all the way through the system, then you don't have to store intermediate results. So you have less DRAM. But what you do need is a lot of compute simultaneously active. And if you have a model, you know, we don't know how big the future models might be. They could get a lot bigger. And if you want to load the whole model in on the thing at the same time, you need a whole lot of compute tiles. Each one of them takes a part of the model. And they all talk to each other seamlessly. Each of these die does. So this is like, it's just a qualitatively different way of thinking about it. We're going to take the whole model and we're going to map it in. In fact, because very few models you're going to run are going to take the whole dojo, right? I get, we, you know, we've got 3,000 die here. You might have a whole lot of jobs that you're running. And some of them take 100, and some of them take 20, and some of them take 50. So uh, in order to use your dojo uh, efficiently, you want to be able to run, you know, run a 10, run a 50, run a 300, run another 300, run a 50, and run all those in parallel, right? So, so dojo is basically built. So like you can see this grid. When they run jobs, they will take vertical slices through this. So you can see there's 15 die in a slice. And you'll like take a slice and you'll apply one or two or three or 10 slices to a, to a problem. And then starting at the next slice, you can apply those to a different problem. And so, so you see, you keep the whole thing busy by basically saying, here's a bunch of jobs. They add up to less than 3000 nodes. We put them all on at once and we run them. And as they finish, you swap one off and you pick another job that's that size or a combination of other jobs that's smaller and you swap them on. So you keep the machine busy by constantly rotating out the jobs. But because the biggest thing you might ever want to run might take 3,000 nodes, you build a 3,000 node fabric. So that's a sea of nodes. It's unbroken. You know, the data just travels seamlessly all the way across this thing. Unlike this is the sea of nodes kind of contrasts with a more conventional cluster where, in, you know, you have a GPU and it's got its local memory. Mm -hmm. And then there's another GPU and you talk through the bus to it, which is slower. Uh, and then you can put, you know, eight of those in a box that, I mean, uh, 
Tesla's other cl GPU cluster has eight in a class. Say that if you want to go to another box, now you have to get on a network fabric and you got to go up, you know, to another box. And that's inside the same rack. If you want to go from that rack to another rack, you might have to go through a different kind of switch, which is even slower. So at each scale, each step, when the job gets bigger and it takes more GPUs, the communication gets, the average communication speed comes down. That's why the efficiency drops because you're spending, you know, you've got all of these compute units, but in a cluster training a neural network, they spend 95% of their time waiting for on other nodes to finish and give them data. And they only spend 5% of their time. So they're really, really fast, but they only get to operate 5% of the time. Mm -hmm. So this is a different approach. It's a really exciting approach. It's risky. Other people mm -hmm. aren't doing it. And it remains to be seen how easily you can map problems onto this and how uh, easy it is to write the whole software stack and get everything working. They have other slides where they try to show us the progress they're making on getting the other stuff working. But that, this is the idea. Got it. So um, what you're saying is, what I'm hearing is, you basically have this, this sea of computer nodes. So it's basically exapod in this case, right? 3,000 yeah. of these D1 tiles. Um, this is a whole exapod. <clears throat> yeah. And you basically put the whole neural network that you're training onto this. Um, and it just seems like it's completely like, it's a, I would say, I don't want to re overdo the word, but like a first principles approach, like you just, mm -hmm. you know, stick it on and train it. It's for doing neural networks. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Is there any, um, are TPUs done? Uh, is Google doing anything like this? Like, so Google has a public? TPU and the arithmetic units that they use inside the TPU are similar. They're not quite yeah. the same, but they're quite similar. Um, they uh actually that's not true i take it back the the fsd chip is similar to the tpu the node so the d1 chips have 354 nodes on them so to take a step back d1 chips are way more flexible than tpus are tpus uh are significantly less flexible um that is kind of okay for google because their their system is naturally batched because they run a server they run server infrastructure where you pretty much always batch everything it, like google uh they don't spin up a computer to answer your search query they take your search query they combine it with the 10,000 other search queries that came in in the last one millisecond and they run that whole batch through the job together right so google's needs are because they operate a data center that provides a, a real-time service to the world their needs are kind of different um so that was that's one aspect of google's tpu google uses um their the size of their multiplier their matrix multipliers is like 128 by 128 which means uh basically you want to run neural networks where the dominant size of the matrices being used in the neural networks is bigger than that like some substantially bigger because you can't process less than a 128 by 128. So like if your neural network is comprised of like 10 by 10 or 50 by 50s, most of your multipliers are getting used most of the time. But if you, if your neural network is composed of thousand by thousands, well, you can break that into, you know, eight of these, uh, eight, uh, TPUs. So you can keep your TPU multipliers busy on Dojo. Uh, each Dojo processor has four eight by eights. Uh, instead. So uh, that so having four different ones gives you more flexibility. Having eight by eights being smaller means you can map them more efficiently onto more different kinds of problems. Each of those eight by eight multipliers, um, group of eight by eight multipliers has some local memory, like 1.25 meg of SRAM. And then it has like a little CPU core that schedules the job and, and stuff. So they, there's 354 of these on a die, and they work together. They can sort of be rearranged into whatever shape you need for the problem that you're working on. So you're still doing a thing which is very much like taking really big matrices, mapping, mapping them onto a fairly regular sequence of subunits that are going to do the computation, and then setting it up so that you can compute, pass the data on, compute, pass the data on, and the next guys do the, you know, you're, the, it's an assembly line for data. So you build your assembly line by taking a bunch of nodes inside a particular D1 to work on a particular subset of the problem. Then, you know, the, 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 nodes, the nodes on a D1 on a D1 die can, they have very high bandwidth, almost seamless to the other 
die on the same chip. It's a little bit slower to go off die, but it's only factor of two, which is a contrast with like typical computers. When you go from one scale of hierarchy to another, and you're typically talking about a 10 X slowdown or something, uh, Tesla is mostly looking at like a 2x slowdown to go from like the node internodes on a die to the next die over, and then another 2x to go from a tile to a different tile. And that's all the ones that they have. They only have two by two slowdowns, you know, interfering with no matter how big your job is. Whereas on a conventional cluster, you might have three 10 times slowdowns. Right? So, so how fast you can go is super scale dependent. The smaller you can make the job, the smaller chunks you can make it, you can run a lot faster. But those chunks, they have to be standalone. They have to not depend on data or intermediate results from other nodes. So a big part of the challenge of running jobs fast on clusters today is like, how do I refactor the job to maximize localization? Dojo kind of throws that away, right? It's just like, you don't refactor the job. You put the whole job on the machine, you run it. Mm, interesting. All right, yeah, let's uh, dive into this more with some more slides. Okay, uh, they gave us a little timeline on Dojo. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, this is I haven't looked at this really closely. But uh, this answers, you know, a question I get a lot is like, do you think they're running Dojo? Do they have a Dojo cabinet? Yeah. Um, you know, when will they be using Dojo to run their own loads? And we kind of get the answer. They, you know, they built their, they had their first Dojo cabinet installed, apparently, in mid-2021. So they've been running it for a while. Uh, and then they give us a data point on their, uh, on, you know, uh, the, the rate at which they're producing stuff. They're building a tile a day. So they need 120 tiles to build. Uh, an exapod, so that means that they're, you know, they, it, it'll take them four months, three months, four months to build all the tiles that they need for an exapod. And they got to a build rate of one tile a day more than four months ago. <laughs> so they've got an exapod worth of tiles sitting around someplace already. So it sounds like they have all the, you know, those parts. If they have one, if they have all those yielded tiles, then the question is like, do they have the internet connect building most of the other stuff that they showed us like scaling that out just for the hardware isn't super tough interconnect is a question they haven't shown us the interconnects that they use between tiles um so we don't know what the status of that is but uh it sounds like they are uh they have dojo cabinets mm -hmm. and they've load tested them and uh so another thing that the building one tile a day thing tells us is uh, they're happy enough with their current design that they're scaling that design. Yeah. They're not at the stage where they're like still changing the silicon or still rethinking the tile in the, the elements that are internal to the tile. Arguably, the tile is the hardest single and the riskiest single part of the whole project. I still, you know, I would like to know more about the interconnects because those seem like as a guy who used to design that kind of interconnect, mm -hmm. I do not take the difficulty lightly. <laughs> Got it. Uh, okay, so let's let's put some uh, context to this. So mm -hmm. one tile a day. Let's say hypothetically they run these A one hundred GPUs at hypothetically ten percent of this capacity, mm -hmm. but they're able to run their D one tiles at eighty percent. So that's at eight times. So each tile would be hypothetically worth eight of their eight A100 so, uh, GPUs, right? Yep. So that would, 100 D1 tiles would be approximate. I mean, these are super rough. Don't hold us to any of this, these numbers. This is just for illustration. So let's say 100 D1 tiles is roughly like 800 A100 chip equivalent, maybe in terms of processing for them okay okay so then that means that's about if they have fourteen thousand right now it's about six percent or so of their total capacity that they'll build within the next few months basically right uh, with, i would say uh, i think the conclusion sounds wrong to me so i think there must be an error in there so a tile is 25 d1s and uh and if you figure that they're 8x faster you know, they're getting 8x more uh, effective yeah. throughput than you get from an A100. Then every tile they build is what is 25 times 8, which is 200. 
uh, GPUs worth of capacity. And if they're doing that a day, then you know, it's 200 GPUs per day. So you get 1,000 GPUs in five days. So 1,000 GPUs a week. So 14 weeks gets you 14,000 GPUs. Really? Like wow. that. Okay. We're, it, 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 if, equivalent if, yeah, capacity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, that we're capacity. talking about. Interesting. So wait, okay. So the D1... Okay, can you break that down one more time here? Okay, yeah. So a D1, if you just look it's at the top, tiles, top line right? numbers, or, or the, a tile is 25 D1s. Yeah, yeah. So a D1 is, if you just look at the you know the top speed number I yeah. was talking about, yeah. it's roughly the same as an A100. Oh, the, the tile or the D1 chip? The D1 chip yeah. is equivalent oh. to like a single GPU in terms of top Got speed. Got it, I thought it was the tile, so it's actually right. the chip. So yeah, so a tile is 25, 25, 25 GPUs. I see. Got it. And so, then if you're getting eight times as much utilization out of them, yeah. you're getting as much utilization out of a single tile as you would get out of what, 200. Got it. So 100 G tiles, let's say, over 100 days, that's basically 20, wait, it's, it's uh, 20. Two, 200 there, GPUs times 100 days is 20,000 GPUs. Yeah, 20,000. Okay. There's, um, got it. There's 25 tiles? On, or 25 D1. 25 die. It's okay. five by five. Okay, yeah. so it's like 25 um, hundred GPUs worth times eight more utilization, yeah. basically. I mean, you Got can it. think of it in exapods. A single exapod yeah. is 120 tiles, right? It's 3,000 die. Yeah. So it would be like 3,000 GPUs. So if yeah. a tile was as fast as a GPU, you'd have a 3,000 GPUs worth of stuff. But if a tile is, as I suspect, closer to eight times yeah. faster than a GPU for Tesla's application in its space, yeah. then it's 24,000 GPUs, right? Yeah. So that's, they're built, I mean... It's a lot That's of a capacity. lot of capacity yeah. they're building right now. Yes. I mean, it's not like a little... Okay, so think about this. Like, if you're getting the equivalent wow. of 24,000 GPUs worth of capacity yeah. out of one exapod, yeah. And they're going to build seven yeah. in Palo Alto, which is another thing they mentioned in a later slide. Yeah. 24,000 times seven is a lot of GPUs yeah, yeah, <laughs> right? yeah, yeah, yeah. of equivalent capacity. I mean, it's interesting right. because, um, yeah, it's, it's 140,000 plus uh, 28,000, 168,000 GPUs. Yeah, I mean, this, isn't, this seems like a big deal, this build rate of one tile a day. There, there are no 168,000 GPU machines on planet Earth. Yeah. I, th I think if you took the largest several machines, wow. it might be that big. Right? Uh -huh. So it's uh -huh. a lot. Do they give a timeline of when they are hoping to build this? They didn't. I, I mean, we'll get to that slide okay. a little bit later. Yeah. But I think I don't remember, and I didn't go back to look at the transcript yet yeah. on that particular point. I had thought that they said, but I was sitting in the audience, the audio was terrible, yeah. that they were going to do that next year. But um, yeah. That's that would be a bit much. I mean, you can we can expect the one one tile a day build rate probably will speed up. Wow. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I think you were doing a Twitter kind of interaction with um, another user who was kind of saying that Tesla won't be running a significant amount of their training power on Doji mm -hmm. trips until like two or three years out or something. To me, two years out. Mm -hmm. um, Maybe less than ten percent, he was saying, or something. But it seems like if they're building one tile a day right now, that yeah, I think his objection is not yeah. that is not that they couldn't build the hardware to do it. Yeah, but rather this is Naveen Rao, and uh, he uh, it's yeah. a, he a guy that knows a lot about the space, mm -hmm. and you know it has very uh, reasonable skepticism mm -hmm. about what's going on in the space. I mean, you know, it's just like, I mean, it's not an easy thing. You know, yeah, it's easy yeah. to to say, yeah. And, and he has said, he thinks it'll be great if they can do it, right? I don't think he's, like, uh, trying to cast shade on it. It's more along the lines of just, like, this is really hard. And uh, because you've got to get all of the software stack yeah. working, and you've got to, you have to write all the libraries that let you map your models. And, you know, NVIDIA's uh, CUDA libraries alone, I mean, they've got all these libraries aside from CUDA, but if you just look at their CUDA libraries, there's so much stuff in there. And if you want to be able to run just like any kind of neural network out of the box, you have to kind of get equivalent functionality to a lot of the stuff that yeah. NVIDIA has. Now, some of it is simplified because there are a lot of a lot of the things in CUDA are, you know, it's, it can be hard to map a neural network onto a GPU. So they might have seven or ten different functions that all basically do the same thing different ways yeah. in order to map your problem onto the GPU. And then 
you know, Tesla's ambition with Dojo is that, that like, there's really only one straightforward mapping for a problem onto a GP. So you don't need the seven functions. So maybe it's less total code, yeah. but still like debugging that stuff and getting it working. That's no yeah. joke. It takes a while. Yeah. They, did Tesla say they're hoping to build their first Exapod Q1 of 2023? Was that one in one of their slides? Yeah, it's in one of the slides okay. here. It's, yeah. Q1 okay. 2023. Interesting. All right. Yeah, it's going to be fascinating next to AI Day to see what they have to show with the joke. But anyways, let's go to this Yeah, AI so this is, yeah. this is stuff that we saw before. I think we saw it at AI Day last time. Well, they showed us yep, the training tile. It really lives. It really exists. Mm -hmm. And it's working. And they showed us running uh, Andre's uh, GPT, one Min GPT, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, a re that's an interesting demonstration. We talked about this once before, so this may be redundant for some people who have seen them, like all the videos. But... Uh, to, to run a single complex neural network requires you to have done all of the basic stuff and have it working. Like you can't have any significant, you can't have two or three significant things that you aren't quite working yet and be able to do this. So it shows a certain level of maturity, which is actually pretty impressive that you've got it. That, I mean, they've, you know, they have all the core math functions mapped onto the, onto the hardware already. And they've, they've got a first cut at the software that they need to uh, to arrange the problem so that it fits onto the the uh, D1 tile architecture, I think when they showed us this, they claimed that they this GPT uh, that they I think they ran it on a single die. I can't actually the print is too small. So running on a single die is one level of complexity. Running on a whole tile is another level of complexity. Talking from one tile to another so that you get a whole tray, which is six tiles working mm -hmm. together, that's another level of complexity. And then the next step up from that is the whole shebang. Mm -hmm. Got it. Each, each of those requires additional sort of stuff to be written, debugged, and working well in order to attain that next la layer, layer of it scale. It seems like, I mean, at the dojo cabinets that they're showing at AI Day, mm -hmm. off to the side, they had like cabinets with six tiles mm -hmm. do you think that that's kind of the stage that they're at right now it's kind of they uh, on the timeline it said that they had built a cabinet um yeah. mid last year okay. so now you know they built it yeah, yeah. <laughs> it uh, they didn't claim to have like run stuff at the at the yes, and i i haven't we'll have to look closely mm -hmm. at these okay. i'm not clear uh to you know how much they've done at cabinet scale in Got terms it. of actually running stuff there and you know that's hard and that that's another reason the fact that they haven't claimed that right yet is a reason to say well yeah maybe it's taken longer than they would like it to mm -hmm. it. so there's a couple of slides here where they they talk about and i think once again this is a recruiting event and they're kind of highlighting the, the kind of work that they do in creating and refining, polishing these systems. They talk, here they're talking about a problem that they encountered designing the voltage regulator module. So the, the D1 tile is built on uh, an interposer, which is a big piece of uh, silicon. Um, so printed circuit board or ICs, you can put them on printed circuit boards, right? That's the way we do most stuff. Or you can put them inside packages. ICs have really, really small uh, contacts on them. And so if you put them on, anything you put them on has to have, has to have a, a, and a degree of fine detail that it, it can be manufactured with that can match at least the size of the interconnections between the die. And then the finer the detail that you can achieve, I mean, ideally, you'd want to go all the way down to the detail of the IC. But like that's really hard to do. Like in fact, we built only the ICs can get down to that level. Um, once upon a time, you could take an IC and you could put it on a clunky circuit board. Um, as ICs have had more and more smaller and smaller contacts, they've had to make these very fancy kinds of circuit boards, and they put them inside the chip package. And then even coming out of that, they'll have like much bigger interconnections to get you down to a regular printed circuit board. Well, if you really want to, to the, the physical size of that connection and the length of that connection has a big impact on how fast you can talk across it and how much power you need in order to drive that signal well. So 
a natural thing you might ask is, well, why don't we make printed circuit boards out of silicon wafers, right? Because they can obviously be patterned really finely. And people have tried doing that. And there have been a couple of approximations to doing that. But there's various kind of thermal and manufacturing things that are pretty tough about it. Anyway, that's what they're doing here. TSMC developed an interposer that's a silicon wafer. It's big enough that they can put all 25 of these die on it. They can flip them over. They can bond them. They can put the interface chips and that stuff on. But you got to get power into it, too. Like, this is, you can't put a really big power bus on the edge because it would be wide enough the chips would have to move apart. You want the chips to be right next to one another, and they're talking together on that top layer. So how do you get them power? You shove it through from the bottom. You use a different dimension. And the way you get the heat out is you take that out the top. So they put a heat sink on top to get the heat out, and they put the power in on the bottom. So these D1 die, they're, you know, 624 square millimeters. So they're the size of a postage stamp, basically. And they've got a 1,000 amps going into them, <laughs> right? Hmm. Like, that's wow. a lot of power. It is crazy. Uh, I think the measure it's so the the die it's 0.86 amps per yeah. square millimeter right so that's basically uh 0.8 amps and like the the wire a paper clip is made out of is like a millimeter in diameter so yeah. this is just it's a it's a monster amount of power mm -hmm. and uh so you have to the power that goes into these things it has to be at just the right voltage and you have to convert it to get it to that voltage at a really high efficiency so you bring in some other voltage supply and you bring it to the die and right next to the die you want to put a power converter because the longer the wire is that goes from the pa the final power converter to the die the more problems you're going to have with the power all kinds of things happen the longer the wire gets so their solution is they make these tiny insanely high power density power regulator modules and they stick them on the bottom of the interposer that's what this puppy is here mm -hmm. it's uh so this thing well you can see it's scaled against a quarter it's also mm -hmm. about the size of a postage stamp it's designed to go right on the bottom of this uh, of this and like if you work in this space you know that a thousand amps in it from something the size of a postage stamp is just kind of mind-bogglingly huge amount of power it's really high power density um so, you know, that, that has consequences for all kinds of things you're trying to do. One of them, they spent a bunch of time talking about the coefficient of thermal expansion. It's on the last line there, right? When things heat up and cool down, they expand. You know, the reason that we have, you know, like slots and bridges is because on a hot day, the bridge concrete expands. And if you don't have a gap to absorb the expansion, the bridge will buckle. And this is what happens on semiconductor chips and printed circuit boards. Like you have to have sort of these elastic inter interconnections between things that don't expand exactly the same or things that might be at different temperatures because otherwise you turn them on and stuff cracks, right? Because it can't, it can't tolerate that. So you can see this, this voltage regulator, it's, on a, it, the, it's, it's mounted on a green thing. That green thing is a printed circuit board. It's made out of like a fiberglass phenolic material. And they're going to mount it on the bottom of a silicon interposer because that's how the power has to get in. So those two, they don't expand mm -hmm. at the same uh, rate when you, when you heat them up. So that introduces all kinds of complexity between those things. Then the, the, the chips that go on this interposer, they also have a coefficient of thermal expansion problem. So they walk through how it's a big problem. And uh, we had a particular bug uh, that got, uh, that manifested partly as a result of the CTE problem, partly as a result of the nature of the electronics. And they walk through how they debugged it, um, which I can talk through a little bit if you think it's interesting. Was that the part where they like burnt out a, a chip? Yep. Okay. Got it. Yeah. So on this next slide, they talk a little bit about the, um, you know, redesigning their module through multiple iterations to reduce the CTE so that they could get the pieces to match. Because that's one way to solve a problem, right? Is it just do this? And does, redesigning to get your CTE down is like, a, it's not easy. And uh, it's, uh, so this is a thing that's gonna, you know, it, it to people in the space, it's going to express like the level of sophistication and seriousness that they're applying to this problem. I mean, to me, the specs are so mind boggling. But that, uh, but anyway, so as they were able to get through these revisions, you could see that they were able to get the, their significant power increase in power. They, 
from like, you know, their zero amps to a thousand amps. And like mm -hmm. in the beginning, they could only get to 300 amps, right, mm -hmm. of operational stuff. And then as they fix a CTE problem, they could just keep turning the power up until eventually they were able to get to what they wanted. They got a 2.9x improvement just by iterating on that CTE problem. Right. So, yeah, by just, you know, addressing that CTE problem, they were able to get a 2.9x uh, power increase. I mean, probably... They originally designed for the thousand amps, and then they found that because of CTE issues, they couldn't get the full thousand amps. Because basically, when as the current density, as as you turn up the current, things get hotter. As things get hotter, the CTE causes things to break. And so, by carefully redesigning things through multiple iterations, they managed to resolve all their CTE issues and eventually get to where they could get the full thousand amps out. Got it. Um, on this slide, they start talking about an intermittent failure problem that they had, which is kind of uh, so you work on these, you, uh, you do this cutting edge electronics. It's really small, has really high power densities. Uh, things break and they're really small. And, uh, and a lot of times, you know, you, they've got all this electronics that's going deep inside this tile. It's going inside a system and then they're doing a bunch of operations then you really got to dig down into the into the thing whenever you have a problem to figure out what's going on uh, a lot of the electronics is hidden deep inside the thing so getting a microscope or x-raying the thing like there's a lot of complexity in uh in being able to address and and debug and modify these things and they, they're kind of walking through mm -hmm. an example of a problem that they had and to people who work in the space like it will indicate sort of the level of sophistication that they're bringing to being able to work on these Got problems. Um, can you go back one slide again? Uh -huh. So um, actually go back one more slide. So with this, um, a thousand amps is going into one D1 chip? Yes. Basically. And so this is the, the voltage regular module underneath the silicon so like right, un, just to put it in chip. perspective this is one d1 chip taking a thousand amps yeah. and a thousand amps is like that's like more than the motor in your car uses by a large margin yeah i mean like it, you're getting up to the scale where like the fuses blow on a model s motor right yeah yeah i mean now the difference is yeah. this is a thousand amps at like a, less than a volt Whereas in your car, right, it's a yeah. thousand amps at a very high voltage. Yes. So in the car, it's much more power for okay. the car motor. I mean, right. this thing's not taking as much power as a car motor, right? The, the single D1 chip. But the thing is, it's the same current, right? It's just mm. much, much lower voltage. So voltage has certain difficulties it presents, mm. and current has other difficulties it presents. Well, all the current difficulties that you have in a Model S motor, you have in one D1 chip, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? The current specific difficulties, because mm -hmm. the current is on the same scale. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Let's advance then. Okay. Um, so they walk through. Uh, this is, so I think the thing that's, that's impressive, that is going to be impressive to people viewing this is how obscure this problem is. So they had, um, they ha so each of these, when you build a voltage regulator, voltage regulators, they use switching circuits to, especially when you're going from DC to DC, you have some voltage coming in and you want to make some other voltage going out. And the way you typically do this is you, uh, is you, you turn one voltage off for a while and then you turn it back on and you turn it off so that the average voltage you get is the voltage that you want out, but you're doing it in a series of spikes. And then the way you get a smooth output voltage is you take that, those spikes, which all average out to the voltage you want out, and you run them through a capacitor. And the capacitor smooths out the differences between the spikes and turns it into a single voltage. Then you have another little regulation phase to make it really smooth when it comes out. But DC to DC converters, that's when you're stepping down. That's basically how they work. They switch on and off the input power at some speed. And then you have a smoothing circuit that smooths it out into a level voltage at the output. So to do the switching and to do it accurately, you need a reference oscillator on board that runs at a reference frequency that you... Uh, that, that is essentially used to derive all the other things that you do. And a lot of power supplies, like if your power supply isn't really dense, you put your oscillator over here and you put your power electronics over here <laughs> because your power electronic, because your oscillator is fragile, mm -hmm. but they don't have that luxury. 
right? They have one of these that they have to put on the back and they're all independent on the back of these D1 die. And they can't, the, the oscillator has to go on the same board that the switching electronics have to go on. So you're taking this thing that's kind of fragile and you're putting it next to these brute force circuits, right? That are really handling a lot of current. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so a thing that happens that's going to happen is you're turning these voltages on and off, you know, and, and instantaneously when you have the, this current goes up and then it goes down and it goes up, things are going to bounce around when you do that. Like hot stuff is going to expand, you know, and you, anyway, it turns out that they're feeding this pulse thing into, uh, into a capacitor and capacitors, a lot of these capacitors, they're made out of uh, ceramic. And ceramic has piezoelectric effects, so they 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 were they're they're pumping this voltage in, and and what the piezoelectric voltage and the and the capacitor causes it to do because it's piezoelectric is when the voltage goes up, it gets tiny bit bigger, goes down, it gets tiny bit smaller, right? So you're you're feeding this current through this capacitor, it's trying to smooth that, and the camera's vibrating at whatever frequency it's the the capacitor's vibrating, and that vibration gets transmitted into what it's connected to. Normally. This is something you ignore. Like normally you're not running so much power through mm. such a small capacitor at such a frequency mm. that the oscillation from the piezo induced from from the from is, is is enough vibration to create a problem. But they they had they have this MEMS oscillator that they put on the same board. And the problem was that they would get a resonance between the the resonant frequency of the MEMS oscillator and these the P, these piezo capacitors and it was causing the MEMS oscillators to crack and fail. Mm -hmm. Okay, why is this interesting? It's freaking obscure, right? Like mm -hmm. how you is like the, the average person debugging this is like, oh my god, how long would it take to get that figured out, right? Yeah. And so they're basically demonstrating a level mm -hmm. of competence and capability, that like. Man, we had this crazy obscure. And then when they fix it, I think uh, mm -hmm. when we go to this next thing, they did three different things to fix it. Mm -hmm. So they added soft terminal capacitors. So basically, they added capacitors that had a little bit of elasticity in their connections to damp out the vibration from the capacitor. Then they switched to a MEMS oscillator. It has slightly lower design so that it didn't vibrate as much in the in the in the in the out of plane Q factor. So this is the plane of the circuit board. Mm -hmm. So this is out of plane vibration. So they changed that, mm -hmm. and then they moved the switching frequency to move it away from the resonant frequency so that the MEMS oscillator and the capacitor wouldn't resonate together. So uh, that's a pretty comprehensive. Uh, you know, they, they they any one of those things could have solved the problem, mm -hmm. and they just. You know, they didn't want to have to do this again, <laughs> basically. <laughs> so they fixed it three different ways. Interesting. Wow. So it's cool. Hardware design. Yeah. Fun, fun. Okay. On this slide. So this is the, we're, they're talking about the cabinet level design and power testing. I don't know. So they design their own cooling system and their own cooling distribution unit. So a cooling distribution unit is like this thing. It's, it doesn't go in any of the cabinets, but the cabinets that have all the, 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 that the exapod sits in, you have to pump a cooling fluid through them, which gets distributed. Mm -hmm. um, and they didn't buy one off the shelf. They looked at, um, they looked at their needs and they decided that um, the specs on the ones that they could get didn't meet their needs. And so they decided that, so, you know, even more vertical integration, Yeah. right? How much longer will they be buying power from the power company? <laughs> <laughs> How vertical yeah. can you go? <laughs> yeah. uh, the, the cabinet looks pretty cool. I liked it. I, I didn't actually get a chance to see yeah. it. Did you go look at it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, it, it was one, it had like, um, they, they were showing, I guess, with six tiles and mm -hmm. then the cooling units, and then it it seemed like a big deal. There was like in the center of the display, mm -hmm. but it, it did look pretty. I think they were saying, um, I was talking to the guy showing it. He was saying, he don't quote me on this, but from what I remember, he was saying something to the extent of like this is. I asked him like if if. Um, Okay, I don't want to mess up, but I asked him if it was running or mm -hmm. what they're doing with it, and he said he said something to the extent of, "This is what we're we're um, like we have one back there and or something," and then he's like, "This is what we're building, I guess, in coming months." You know, the whole cabinet and everything. Mm. 
And so it seemed like something that they were like really gearing up for, you know. Mm. Um, so yeah, I I, I thought it's interesting that they they have a stainless steel, mm. um, you know, stamped cover on the thing, and it's all like angles and stuff. It's like this whole <laughs> stainless trick. steel and angles. Like <laughs> 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 yeah. It's our cyber computer. Or yeah, whatever. Exactly. It's like, you know, cyber they even have Dojo the, the cool logo. <laughs> 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 yeah. Cool. Okay. Okay. Um, so I think a significant amount of this stuff might be redundant with the stuff we covered on the first. Uh, they talk about the training tile. They give some mm-hmm. basic specs. So they all of the we had all these data. I think the four hundred watt TDP might be a new. So that's the um, that's the power envelope that the thermals are designed to deal with. So it's like. Um, it's the max power dissipation that the that the chip is basically designed to handle. So 400 watt TDP, just to put it in perspective, like that's on the scale of like A100s and other GPUs that are comparable size that have, you know, similar similar top speed numbers, right? But Dojo is doing it at a fraction of the size, right? Um, of an A100. Well, you could. It's. A uh, fraction of the size. The die is comparable yeah. in size to an A100 die. Okay. So the die, it, they're 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 built on similar silicon processes. They have mm. similar numbers of transistors, you know, plus or minus a factor of 20, 30%, something like that. Um, their power budget is kind of similar. I mean, the big difference, the thing where Dojo wins, I think, you know, according to my numbers, mm. is that... Uh, is that, you know, it gets 80 miles an hour for its 400 watts and the A100 gets 10 miles an hour for its 400 watts but because of the efficiency hit that you take because basically, I mean, an A100 can run really efficiently if you can load your whole problem on the chip, but none of the interesting problems, okay. very few of the interesting problems fit on the chip. So then you have to decide, do I put it on two chips, 10 chips, 50 chips? The more chips you put it on, the faster you get your answer. But the more chips you put it on, the less efficient the system gets, right? Mm-hmm. The less you get out of each chip. It, it, it's not a, it, it's definitely diminishing returns kind of thing, right? Mm-hmm. Um, if you're running a big, uh, if you're training a big ne- neural network and you want the answer relatively soon, even though it's inefficient, you use a lot of nodes, uh, what Dojo is trying to do is even when you use a lot of nodes, it's still efficient. So we just run our big jobs whenever we want to. We get the efficiency we, um, and we don't have the trade off that you have with the GPU. I guess that's another way of thinking yeah. about it. Makes sense. Um, okay. So I walk through the system tray. This is the, the, there's two of these trays in a cabinet. Each tray has the power electronic. Well, it's got, so power comes in from the bottom. But you can kind of, if you look at the dojo tile here, you see the copper heat spreader plate. You see the mm-hmm. aluminum sort of mechanical support underneath. So the the top of it has a liquid uh, heat exchanger that goes on top that screws down, and that connects to sort of liquid pipes that it, that pump cooling fluid. So the heat comes out the top. Mm-hmm. On the bottom, the, the those power electronics we were talking about, there's 25 of those little modules mm-hmm. connected to the bottom. You can kind of see the edge of them here, the way mm-hmm. we're looking at it. And then it seems like around the outside of those, they have a ring of connectors that are used to pass data to the next tile over. And we don't, you know, we don't see the cables that go between those either. So these things, they basically get mounted on this mechanical thing. I think they said, do they have the weight? 135 kilograms. So six tiles is 135 kilograms. They're pretty heavy. (laughs) Did you pick one up? No. I heard no. some people that said it was like picking up lead. Oh, wow. Yeah. Huh. Uh, okay. And then they, they repeat the uh, the basic specs on the thing. 2,000 amps at 52 DC. So they're saying here they got 2,000 amps. It's 2,000. Maybe I'm getting this wrong. 2,000 amps. Oh, yes. Yeah, 2,000 amps at 52 volts. Yeah, the individual die are a thousand amps at like zero point eight volt or zero point six volt. So that's why the difference in amps. Um, so two thousand amps at fifty two volts. If you were efficient and you stepped it down to, uh, it, well, if you stepped it down to point five volt, that would give you uh, a one hundred multiplier. So that'd be two hundred thousand amps 
So if you had 1,000 amps, that would be 200 die. And it's 150 die. So that's about right for efficiency. Yeah. 2,000 amps at 52 volts is about uh, 1,000 amps at 1 volt times 25 times 6. Yeah. Or not 1 volt, probably 0. 0.6, 0. 0.7 volts. Because like basically it's, it's 6 tiles with 25 D1 chips. Yeah, so tile. so the, the 1 volt DC feed into each tile is 25,000 amps. Got it. Yeah, if it's a thousand amps per D1, I think uh, Elon had mentioned some number that was fifteen thousand amps at the first AI day. So that's kind of a different number. But depending on where in the conversion chain you're looking and the voltage you're talking about, um, you could get different numbers. But two thousand amps at fifty-two volts. So that's um, yeah, I guess they have it right there. It's over hundred kilowatts of power. Oh. Uh so your uh, your model your model S battery could run this for one hour. <laughs> so it's using more power than your car does, like at highway speed by a factor of like four yeah. <laughs> or something. Yeah. Okay, Dojo interface processor. Okay, so now we get to another aspect of uh, the challenge of getting uh, the Dojo approach to doing this stuff to work, and that is that you got to feed this beast you got to feed data into it so it doesn't have a lot of storage in that that sea of nodes mm. it's it's sram and it doesn't have a lot of storage and yet it's able to crank through data at this insane rate and so if it's not cranking through the data that's on it you have to feed the data from outside so uh tesla's answer for this is they build an interface processor um which is this a PCI card? PCI is, you know, it's the interface standard for like for PCs. This is PCI V4, and I think it's probably pretty wide. It might be 64, 128 bit wide PCI. And they say 800 gigabytes per second total memory bandwidth. So you get a set of these that sit. So underneath the power layer of the of the tiles there's a rack that these dojo interface processors go in because they the ends of them connect up to one end of the tiles actually so you know the the tray has a three by two sort of array mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. uh is it three yeah so on the two yeah on the two side on both ends so you have like three and then three and then dojo interface processors connect to these uh sorry the two ends so mm -hmm. if it's one two three four five six so you have a two by three array at the two sides dojo interface processors connect to both ends this end and to this end and there's uh there's one of these for every die in the tile so you like have five of them underneath each tile. So you would have 10 of these boards across for the two wide tiles and then 10 more at the other side. So there's 20 total and each of them provides 800 gigabytes per second. So 20 boards times 800 gigabytes per second is 1.6 terabytes per second that you can feed into this monster. Wow. Um, so, uh, most of the, there's, there's kind of two ways that you can feed this sea of nodes that, uh, they talk a little bit about this a little bit later. One of them is, uh, the sea of nodes is designed so that each node just talks to its neighbors can left the North, South, East, West neighbors. So data will kind of, you know, typically you'll structure problems so that data flows from one side and flows through the nodes for the, for the, for the problem. So the, these things are basically set so that the so that the data that you need to feed into the system that you're processing will feed across the fabric in that direction, kind of straight across the fabric. But when you want to swap, when you want to load a new job in, uh, you know, if you have all these nodes, if you if you if you want to load a new program into a bunch of these things, if you feed it from the edge, you have to feed through a lot of tiles. So they they added another communication layer on top of this. 
so-called high radix one, where they have intermediate connections that drop into the fabric so that you don't have to, so that not everything has to shift all the way through the fabric. There are points that you can drop in in the middle to, uh, and they, they demonstrate later how that how they make this useful and give some numbers on it. Anyway, Dojo Interface Processor. Mm -hmm. This is the super high performance interface that keeps the beast fed. So it can uh, keep all those arithmetic units running. Okay. Disaggregate. Oh, so even though you, so you can't store intermediate results in the, on, in the dojo fabric itself, the sea of nodes. Um, you still need to store intermediate results. Um, and so uh, you want to have a bunch of DRAM memory that's as close as you can get, even though you can't put it inside the fabric, because you're going to store stuff in the DRAM that you want to quickly load into the system. It's going to get right out of that DRAM, fed through that 800. This is the disaggregated high-speed memory that sits mm -hmm. off the... Got it. Right? Yeah. So they have... so. You know, like the interface processors, you have these memory cards that sit down there and they're providing the the storage, which is basically right at the right next to the tile for feeding it quickly. So that memory gets fed by this high high rate Z plane connectivity. So that memory has a direct memory access network card attached to it that connects to a network switch so that hosts can basically tell a particular uh, dojo interface processor fetch this from that other node or fetch this from storage mm -hmm. and then they can use the the memory card does the direct memory access to fetch that across the network and preload it into the DRAM so that when the when the sea of nodes is ready for it it can be shoved through that you know 800 gigabyte per second times five interface into a tile got it okay yeah, so I guess I have. I took a couple of photos mm -hmm. of this. So uh, here we're looking at, I guess this one is the tray from the top. This is the tray. You can see the Dojo interface processors, and mm -hmm. the memory would be down here too. Uh, so then they do a thing. 10 from the front and 10, 10 from the back. Yeah. Yeah, okay. That's right. Got I it. said there were 20. Yeah. So there's five and five, yeah. and then five and five on the other side. Yeah. And it's on the by two side. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So data for that middle row of... of things it mm -hmm. flows through the two the the end tiles to get right. to it right um okay and then this is the same thing with the chassis put on the bottom so underneath this the the, the first part of this is just the slots that those memory cards drop into and then underneath that we have host processors so there's a regular cpu in in underneath these things that manages organizing the data and sending commands to the network and so this is a bunch of, do they tell? It's an x86 Linux, 512 x86 cores. And I imagine that that's across all six tiles. So they have uh, 500. Uh, so I think uh, I was sitting next to a guy who said that must mean that they're AMD processors because you can't get an even number out of the Intel, the, the latest, greatest Intel processors. Mm -hmm. So eight terabytes of memory. And then it has 648 gig gigabyte per second PCI bandwidth for the hosts, I think. Okay. Yeah, so this is a picture of the dojo cabinet kind of with the walls taken off. Mm -hmm. So you can see there's two trays. Yeah. Each of the trays has one of those bricks from the previous, you know, that has the slots for the dojo interface processors and then a set of uh, hosts sitting underneath that. Looks like four hosts, 512. So that's what 128 cores per host it looks like. Okay, and then those these things on the top and bottom they are um, power converters. So power that comes in from the outside will get converted. I think they use 52 volts inside the cabinet, and I think they use 480 volts outside the cabinet. So this takes the 480 volts, converts it to the 52 volts to be sent down to the other parts of the system. Got it. Xpod. So that's a dojo walkthrough. We didn't learn a ton of new stuff on this uh, mm -hmm. about dojo. I think, are there, yeah, so now we go to the dojo software stuff. Mm -hmm. So the, the basic numbers that they quote in this slide are the same numbers that we saw before, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. Certainly the top line number of exaflops is. Okay. So 
there's a lot of software that needs to be written to get to make Dojo useful for what they want to use use it for, which is basically a neural network accelerator. Um, if you write, uh, so they, you know, the neural net mo models sit on, on the top. The blue thing is that's the thing that's specific to your neural network. Then that talks to PyTorch. So PyTorch is a language that is super popular for doing neural networks. And um, there are a few. PyTorch and TensorFlow are the two most popular frameworks. Uh, PyTorch is really popular in the research community. TensorFlow tends to be a bit more popular in like the production community. Um, TensorFlow has more modules for running on more different types of devices. So like if you want to like build a neural network that you're going to run on your iPhone, you know, TensorFlow will get a module for that. You can write your network, get it working on your computer, and then you can back compile it to your phone, your laptop, your iPad, whatnot. TensorFlow is good at that. PyTorch is considered easier to, and quicker to modify for doing uh, so for like investigating neural network type shapes. So it's more popular in the research community. Anyway, Tesla, they're using PyTorch. So to use PyTorch on Dojo, they have to build a Dojo extension. So PyTorch has an interface for hardware accelerators that you, that allow, enable the, 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 I mean, PyTorch is an interpreted language. Uh, anyway, the infrastructure of PyTorch needs to understand a certain amount about the hardware that it's going to run on so that it can pre-configure the modules to run well on the hardware. The Dojo extension is basically Tesla writing the, the uh, numer uh, numerical accelerator, accelerator module to plug into PyTorch that describes their system and provides all the functions that PyTorch needs in order to be able to like outport uh, modules that will run well on Dojo. So then uh, the stuff that comes out of that needs to go into a compiler that will compile down to code that's going to eventually run on that. So they have to write their own compiler. They mention here that they're using an LLVM backend. So LLVM is a widely used compiler framework. I forget what it stands for. It's kind of the standard compiler that gets used in Linux environments anymore, and the standard high-performance compiler that gets used in a lot of outside. It's open source. Um, it's been developed over a bunch of years. It's considered rock solid. It's very uh, got a ton of features. Uh, they built their compiler on top of LLVM. So basically, that lets them use all of this, these powerful capabilities that LLVM has, and they just have to write the parts that are specific to their instruction set and their optimization needs and whatnot that sit on top of that. So that code comes out, and the, the, then you need a set of Dojo drivers. So operating systems require device drivers to talk to the lowest level uh, of the hardware. Um, this the do, the dr device drivers basically have a register level uh, description of the hardware. Like, what do I write into what byte in what register in order to get the hardware to do a particular thing? So the code that understands the hardware at that kind of level, so they have to write the Dojo drivers. That's it. Then there's the Dojo interface process, so that's a hardware thing. It probably has a, a BIOS, and they probably write their own like super low-level code that sits on top of that. And then the Dojo interface processors, they go into the surdays. So the surdays are the uh, the interface that, between the tiles, or surdays. Uh, surdays stands for serializer, deserializer. So when you have very high speed interfaces that use a very small number of wires, you always have a surdays. Um, because you're taking data that's coming out kind of in parallel fashion, and then you're turning it into a serial stream at extremely high data rates. So surdays are always built in these exotic high speed uh, silicon processes. And that then you get to your exapod. So that's the whole, that these are the modules that you need to build to get everything working. Okay. So, we know that they have at least a first cut at all of these, by the way, because we, we know that they're running code mm -hmm. on these things. Uh, and they've basically shown us, like, these are the components. And, the, and to, to people who are thinking about going and working there, this would be, oh, I know about LLVM. I would mm. be a good fit for this team. Or I'm interested in LLVM. Or I'd love to try to adapt LLVM to this particular thing. Mm -hmm. Or PyTorch or device drivers, right? Mm. Uh so they have a couple slides here where they talk about like what you have to do to get good performance. I think they highlight each one of these, and I just did the first and last. Uh, 
All right. Um, so what we're going to do right here is we're going to um, cut off this video at this section. We were planning on doing the whole dojo one take, but we're going to do two takes or two parts. So this will be part one, mostly covering the hardware, right? Yeah. We, we entered into the software, but we're going to go ahead, push that off to part two dojo, mm. cover the software section. And then we've got um, Tesla's FSD stack, which is perhaps the, the most yeah, comprehensive, the big one. The big one. Um, we are going for over three and a half hours right now. I think we're all, we're burnt out. Our brains are fried and we're a little bit antsy. So we're going to stop, um, here. We just did in one recording, one sitting, we did the Optimus and Dojo. Um, and yesterday we actually did a, a two hour interview as well with our general mm -hmm. thoughts. So anyways, um, I think the rest of our interviews might be remote. Um, this is kind of, uh, it's been great actually in person. Mm, I yes, love yes. it. Yeah. Yeah. It's been good. Um, but yeah, hopefully, um, yeah, we'll be able to do, um, the rest of the series, uh, coming up in the next few days or next week, probably mm. if, if James gets back to LA. Um, anyways, thanks, um, everyone for watching, for tuning in and, uh, joining this, uh, process. And thanks James for <laughs> extending your, your generous time and efforts to explain um, all of this stuff to everyone. Appreciate it. Okay, great.